Highlander's Flower, written by Barbara Bard and published by Starfall Publications. Subscribe for more audiobooks. Enjoy. Chapter 1 My child, this is a day I have long waited for, yet my heart is mixed with happiness and sorrow, Lord Charles Brambley said, his eyes tinged with wistful tears. Before him stood his daughter Rosemary, who looked demure in a white frock, with her brown tresses of hair cascading down past her shoulders. Smiling sweetly, she bowed her head in front of her father. He leaned in to kiss her on her cheek. His moustache tickled, and she tried not to shudder. I must admit I am feeling nerves myself, father. You shall be fine, my girl. This marriage will be a boon to this family, and we shall be strong going forward. Lord Harold is a fine man, and he will make a good husband, of that I am sure. I only wish that I had the chance to know him first aside from the glimpse I have stolen upon his visits here. That is part of the fun. You will have the rest of your life to get to know him, and I know he is excited to meet you. I have assured him of your beauty. I believe the mystery appealed to him. Rosemary exhaled deeply and looked around at her room. Having just turned eighteen, her life had begun in earnest, although she did not feel that she had lived at all yet. Having just come into her own as a woman, she was already being ushered off to another man, Lord Harold Flynn. By all accounts he was a fine man, and yet Rosemary found herself filled with hesitation rather than excitement. Indeed, her father showed more enthusiasm for the affair than she herself did. For his sake, she feigned anticipation and acted in the manner that her father would have wished. I just hate to leave you alone, she said, reaching out and clasping her father's hands. Even though they had been gnarled by age, his fingers were still smooth. I shall be fine. It is the natural order of things that a father should say goodbye to his daughter as she embarks on the greatest adventure known to man. I have the servants with me, and my friends. You know what I mean, father. You need the company of one who loves you. I so wish mother were here, Rosemary said, gazing wistfully at the bed where she would lay as a child nestled in her mother's lap. There her mother would read her stories, every night before she slept without fail. Her father squeezed her hands and smiled kindly. As do I, but we must make the most of the years we have been given. I know that she would be proud today. She would probably have some wise words to say as well. She always knew what to say. How did you feel when the two of you were to be married? Much the same as you feel now. I was trying my best to act stoic, but inside my stomach was churning. Your mother, I believe, was very anxious, and it was only when she took her first steps in this house that she was calmed. All those fears disappeared when our eyes met. She was the loveliest creature I had ever seen. Well, until you were born, that is. Every time I look at you, I am reminded of her. You are the spitting image of her, right down to your birthmark. Rosemary smiled as she looked down at her stomach and placed her hand just above her hip. I always remember she would show me hers when she bathed me. She said that we were linked, that it was proof we had a part of each other inside us. Exactly. I know that you have her strength and that this is the beginning of the best days of your life. Lord Harold is a fortunate man and I am sure that he will prove his love to you over and over again during your marriage. I hope you are right, Rosemary said. Charles smiled again and wrapped his strong arms around her in a fatherly embrace. Squeezing her tightly, Rosemary almost felt the breath driven from her lungs. Believe me, Rosemary, this day is more difficult for me than it is for you. Long have I dreaded the day where I would have to say goodbye to my only daughter, but this is what you have been destined for since the day you were born. I shall do my utmost to make you proud she said, curtsying as she stepped back. Charles looked at his daughter and wiped a tear from his eye, declaring that he would leave her to make her final preparations. With that, he left the room, and Rosemary was alone. Now that her father was gone, she could let her mask slip. Falling onto the bed, she felt the soft mattress sink under her weight. Her hair fell over her face as she placed her head in her hands and tried not to weep. Rosemary was being forced to leave the only home she had ever known to marry a stranger. 
It was something that her father had tried his best to prepare her for. But now that the day had arrived, Rosemary's head was spinning. She hadn't been able to tell her father the truth, that she did not want to be married. It had been hard for her, knowing that she was different from the other girls growing up. Whenever they talked about their futures, they were all excited to be married to a lord or a duke, forming alliances through marriage that would lead their families to greater riches and giving birth to sons and daughters they hoped would rise through the upper echelons of society and leave a formidable legacy. Rosemary had always had a grim feeling in her mind whenever these matters were spoken of. Rising from the bed, Rosemary moved to the window and peered outside. The sky was clear of clouds, and the golden sun beamed down upon the rolling green clouds. A road stretched from the house into a dark forest, and beyond that lay her future. When she was younger, she had often gazed out of this window and wondered about the world outside, wanting to know what adventures awaited her. Rosemary's mind had been inspired by the stories her mother told, of great warriors and quick-witted princess. She had been certain her destiny lay out there, not in the arms of some other lord. Rosemary wanted to be one of the heroes in the stories. She wanted to find her destiny by herself not to be stuck in another room where she would forever be gazing out at the world. She wanted to be out in the world. When she had turned fourteen, Rosemary had tried to strike out on her own. She had filled a sack with some biscuits, bread and cheese, then strode out towards the forest. Rosemary barely got a few feet before she was pulled back, reaching out futilely, feeling as though she was being held back from her future. After this, her father had had a strong talk with her about her duty and how she was responsible for ensuring that the family endured. Never before had she seen her father so passionate about a matter, and it only made her feel more guilty for the feelings she held in her heart. She simply couldn't see how she could be happy being the wife of a lord and nothing more. Of course, after that talk, she could never reveal her true desires to her father, so she played the part of the dutiful daughter in the hope that, eventually, it would become the truth. It was not to be. And now she was still filled with that longing to be out in the world, riding through the trees with the wind at her back, ready to meet whatever challenge faced her. Rosemary turned from the window. It would do herself no good to focus on the life she could not have. It was a difficult truth to swallow, but it was the truth. By the door sat a wooden chest. It contained all her worldly possessions. It seemed strange to her that every aspect of her life could be held within a chest of that size. She thought she was more than that. Lifting the lid, she looked inside. Mostly there were garments folded neatly by her handmaid Sarah. Resting on top of them all was a golden locket. Rosemary took it in her hands. It was an oval shape and had a hefty weight to it. The gold chain flowed along her hand, deftly made. It was the work of a true craftsman. On the back of the locket, the house symbol was etched, a sword flanked by red roses. Rosemary ran her thumb across the coat of arms. Soon enough she would adopt another name, another house, but she would always be a Brambley. Inside the locket was a small painting of her mother and father when they were her age. It was strange to think of her parents as young people, with passions and hopes of their own. Would she have a daughter of her own one day and give her a locket with a picture of herself and Harold inside? Would this daughter then be looking at the locket in much the same way as Rosemary was looking at hers? It seemed as though life was a cycle, repeating itself through the ages. No, Rosemary thought firmly. If she had a daughter, she would not be shackled to this wheel. Rosemary would make certain that her daughter would get to live the life she wanted. If that option was not open to Rosemary, then she would ensure that it was to her daughter. However, she then wondered ruefully if her own mother had had that same thought. Sometimes it seemed as though life worked of its own accord, and that she was simply swept up in its current. Pulling her hair out of the way, Rosemary fastened the locket around her neck. It rested against her chest, and she felt better for having it there. She was venturing into new lands and wanted to have a reminder of her family close to her heart. It is almost time, my lady, the plain-looking handmaid Sarah said, 
stepping into the room. Rosemary nodded and seared. It is strange to be leaving this home. I feel the same way, my lady. You and your father took me in so long ago that I have thought of this as my home, and I am just as upset as you. I am glad you are coming with me, though. It is as though I am taking a piece of home with me. At least we shall have each other to remind ourselves of the familiar. Indeed, Lady Rosemary, I am honoured that I have been chosen. There was no other choice to make. You have been with me since we were children. In truth, I think of you as more of a friend than a handmaiden, even a sister. Such words are music to my ears. I have always thought of you as the same. Ever since my parents were killed in the war, I have longed to feel part of a family again. I know it is not the same, but the way you and Lord Brambley have treated me is the closest I shall ever get. Until you have your own family, Rosemary reminded her. Sarah blushed and dipped her head. I do not know about that. One day you shall meet a fine blacksmith, a hardy man who will take care of you, and you shall raise some strapping children. Perhaps, my lady, but you will beat me to love. I suppose, but there is doubt in my mind. Is not Lord Flynn one of the most desirable men in England? Oh, indeed, especially from what father says. By the way father speaks about Lord Flynn, I often wonder if he would like to marry the young lord as well, Rosemary said. The girls tittered with laughter. You do not agree with his assessment? Sarah asked. I have no reason to fear my father would lead me astray, but there are times when I feel envious of you. Of me? Sarah said, astonished. Indeed. You will get to choose freely whichever man you wish to marry, be he a blacksmith or a baker. The choice is yours, whereas mine has been made for me. That is because my choice does not matter. Your children will be a part of a dynasty and may shape the future of England. Precisely my point, Sarah. Sometimes I feel as though my life is nothing more than a cog in an endlessly turning wheel. Rosemary sighed. It was clear that Sarah did not know what to say, and Rosemary didn't want her to feel uncomfortable. Go and tell my father that I shall be down shortly, she said. Sarah nodded and left Rosemary alone. Taking one last look around her childhood room, Rosemary dabbed at her eyes with a handkerchief. When she had been younger, this room had been the whole world to her, and now she was unlikely to ever see it again. A new house waited for her, with a room she would have to share with her new husband. The thought was almost enough to make her shudder, and she gripped the handle of the door to steady herself. There were so many unknowns lying in wait for her, but she couldn't shake the feeling that if she walked the path her father had laid out for her instead of her own, she would always regret it. It was impossible to think that way, though. It was selfish to think that way. She simply had to harden her heart and resolve herself to this fate. She was to be married to Lord Harold, to bear him children and enjoy a prosperous life with him. When she met him, she hoped that these feelings would disappear and that she would fall in love with him instantly, just as her mother had fallen in love with her father. Mother had always told her that there was one special man for everyone out in the world waiting for her, and that if they found each other, it would be the most wonderful feeling in the world. Was Lord Harold Flynn that dashing figure? She had to hope so, because if there was another man for her she would be forever unhappy, as Lord Harold was the man she was going to marry, and there was nothing that was going to change that. Chapter 2 I've got you new. Blair thought to himself as he waited to pounce. Every sinew in his powerful body was primed to make the final leap forward and slay the beast before him. It had been a long hunt, lasting the better part of a day, and the sun would begin to dwindle soon. If Blair did not catch his prey before the sun set, he would have to return home empty-handed, for at night he would become the prey to the wild beasts that lurked in darkness of night. Blair's fingers curled around his spear as he watched the beast intently. It stood, unaware that it was being tracked. Its head was bowed as it grazed the floor, pulling up grass and flowers to eat. Blair's stomach rumbled as he thought about sinking his teeth into the juicy flesh, and he instantly cursed, 
hoping that his body would not betray him. The animal didn't notice, however. It was alone, vulnerable, and ripe to be slaughtered. Blair grinned as he savoured this moment, the moment when he knew that he was triumphant, when he knew that he was victorious, when he knew that he had won. The light would soon go out in the beast's eyes and it was all down to Blair. He had earned this kill and he would enjoy the plaudits given to him by the rest of the clan when he returned. Yeah, mine knew, Blair thought to himself, ye hae been worthy prey, but like all the others you will fall to my might. But how I wish you were a warrior, ready to fight back instead of standing there helpless. This is the closest Tay battle I can come, but it's nay close enough. The antlered beast stirred for a moment as a bird flew away, making the leaves shake. The area around him was cast in a green light as the thick, broad leaves shielded the forest from the sun. The sound of a scurrying animal greeted his ears, but he was not going to lose his focus. Raising the spear above his shoulder, Blair leaned back. His biceps glistened with sweat and his thick shoulder-length hair brushed against his face. Blair steadied his breathing, inhaling through his nose, then exhaling through the mouth. Each breath was smooth and clear. His body was one with the spear. It was as though it was a part of him. He brought it back and summoned his formidable strength. His other arm stretched out before him, and each of his fingers pointed at the beast's heart. Blair felt the weight of the spear in his hand, and then, when he was ready, launched the weapon forward with all the strength he could muster. Bellowing in the heat of the primal moment, he flung his body forward, giving the spear as much momentum as was possible. The roar did alert the beast, who looked up from its snack, but it was too late. Just as it realised the danger it was in, the spear embedded itself deep in its chest. It yelped and sank to the floor, its legs writhing, its head twisting due to the pain. Blair leaped forward as the animal tried its best to scramble away, but it was helpless. You were a noble foe, Blair said, having a lot of respect for the creature he had been tracking for hours. But you were unable to match my prowess. One day I shall find a foe worthy of me, and I shall slay him like a beast. One day I shall stand with my brothers in an army and fight the Sassanax. I ken they're planning something waiting to strike. Such a vile enemy dinny engage in peace. They're waiting, lurking, and we canny allow ourselves to be weak. The length of the hunt made the triumph all the sweeter, though, and he would savour the meat when it was cooked more than anyone. Grabbing a knife from around the small of his back, he quickly slit the animal's throat, putting it out of its misery. He sighed and looked down at the dead body. The milky, lifeless eyes stared into nothingness. The long, pointed antlers were still. Blood pulsed onto the ground. The stag had been majestic when it had been alive but now it was just a carcass. Sometimes I feel the same way, Blair said. You're dead new, but at least ye had lived. I had ne'er had the chance. The closest I get to warfare is by hunting animals. Ne'er hae I ken the thunderous feeling of fire and blood coursing through my veins. Maybe I ne'er will. My father was fortunate to live in the world when the war waged. How I would have loved to have tested my mettle against the Sassanac warriors. I was born into the wrong time, which is all the worst fur ye, my friend. Instead of battling the Sassanax, I am hunting your kind. Blood seeped from its neck and flowed to the ground, pooling around Blair's feet. He placed one foot on its still chest and gripped his spear, yanking it out. He then wiped it on the ground beside him, for it had been covered with the innards of the beast. Blair sheathed the spear across his back and then collected the animal straining as he did so. The beast was heavy, and for the first time that day Blair wished that he had company. Returning home was something that Blair knew he would have to do, but in truth he would have much rather stayed out in the forest. It had always been more of a home to him than anywhere else. He could be free out here, and not have to worry about any of his responsibilities as the eldest son of Laird Aif of the McCall clan. Still, Hauling the beast back to his home would be as great an effort as the hunt itself, but it would make the clan all the more impressed. With sweat pouring from his temples, Blair dragged the beast by its feet through the forest, leaving a trail of blood in its wake. 
There were occasions when Blair sensed the presence of other animals, but he knew that they would not attack. He was the master of this domain, and none of them would dare to challenge him. Still, it wild be nice to be challenged once in a while. Is it such a sin for a man to want to prove himself against the best warriors? I ha half a mind to run across the border and fight the Sassanaks new. I wonder how many I would be able to kill before I was forced to flee. Ten? Twenty? It has always surprised me how the Sassanaks managed to fight a war against us. We're the mightiest warriors. The Sassanaks are a cunning enemy, though, and they had the numerical advantage. I wish Fayther would let me venture into England and remind them that we're here. Soon they will forget, and we shall ne'er have the chance to prove ourselves in combat again. Smiling to himself as he continued forward, his feet brushed against fallen leaves and twigs snapped under his steps. The woods had always seemed somewhat mystical to him, mostly because his mother had told him stories from a young age. She had spoken of nymphs and fairies coming alive at night to enact chaos on anyone they snared in their grip. As he grew older, Blair realised that she had likely told him these stories in order to frighten him and make sure he stayed away from the forest when it was dark. The stories had had the opposite effect, though, and Blair had spent as much of his life as he could in among the trees and woods, hoping that one day he would see a nymph or a fairy for real. Until then, he would hunt, which is what he was best at. Unrivaled for strength and stature in his clan, Blair was a mighty warrior, and he often brought back food for the clan to eat. Most of them thought he was doing it out of a sense of duty, but for Blair, his purpose was entirely self-serving. The only way he could feel freedom was to be out in the world, feeling the wind at his back and breathing in the open air. In the forest with the animals he felt at peace, while at home he felt stifled. This was true freedom, he thought to himself as he made his way through the forest, but became more despondent as he grew nearer to home. His shoulders and back were aching after having dragged his prey, but he was not going to show any sign of weakness now. He had a reputation to maintain after all. We wondered if you were ever going to return, his brother Drew said as Blair emerged from the forest. In the distance, on top of a hill, the family home stood. It was a small stone castle, its grey walls in contrasts with the vibrant green hill upon which it stood, and the blue sky that lay beyond. Blair should have felt relief at the sight of home, but instead he felt a deep sense of gloom. All the enjoyment of the hunt flowed out of his body, and he wished he could have stayed in the forest all night. Did you really think a hunter like me would be killed? Blair replied in his rumbling voice, leaving the deer for his brother, who picked up the slack. Blair's return was noticed by a few other clansmen, and he beckoned for them to give him aid. They rushed over and helped Drew carry the beast to the castle, where it would be skinned and prepared for the fire. It has been kent to happen to others. All it takes is one mistake. I do not make mistakes, Blair growled. He quickened his pace and tried not to glower. We shall be eating well tonight, he cried out. The sight of the stag was met with much rejoicing, and he was met with many statements of gratitude. Drew shook his head and sighed. Fayther wants to see ye, he said. Blair's expression darkened. I am sure it's nay something I should meet with excitement. I imagine it's something the day with duty and honour. Blair snorted. Those matters that weigh heavier than a mountain. Indeed, and once again, I am fortunate that you were born before me. Oh, if only things were different, Blair said, slapping his brother around the back. Drew stumbled forward but took it in his stride. And how are you going to meet your glory, Drew? In these times of peace it's going to be difficult fur warriors like us to find our place in history. There will always be opportunities, Drew said. We must just be patient and seize them when they arrive. I would rather go out and seize them, Moselle, Blair said, looking down at the beast he slew. A warrior must go out and find their glory. It will ne arrive on a platter. And how many animals do you think you had to kill before you claim your place in the afterlife? The question was not said with malice, but Blair grunted as he strode towards the castle. The blood I shed may nay be in war, but I am still proving myself. We can only fight the foes in front of us no more, he said, 
and then increased his pace to walk away from Drew. Blair loved his younger brother, but sometimes Drew maddened him. The boy seemed to think that everything would come to him if he just waited. Blair was well aware life was not like that in the slightest. Glory was something you had to go out into the world and seize with your own to hands, wrest it from the gods and claim as your own. Yes, the beasts he slaughtered were not as impressive as slaying vicious enemies, but the more blood he shed, the more he was prepared when that day of glory did come. Blair was not content to sit in his castle and get fat. He was a lean man, his body packed with taut muscles, as though he was carved from marble. As he stalked through the camp that lay outside the castle, women gazed admiringly at him, although none of them approached him yet. One day he would make a wife out of one of them, at least that's what his father wanted. His father wanted so many things for him, though. Sometimes it felt to Blair as though he wasn't living his own life at all, but the life his father wanted for him. Blair stalked like a wild animal into the castle feeling the air cool as he stepped into the stone walls. The people of the castle bowed and curtsied to him as he passed, but he gave them nary a glance. As he walked into the main chamber, his fists clenched, and he gritted his teeth. Ah, my son, I've said, sitting on his wooden throne. Blair walked up to him and sank to his knee out of respect. The room had one long table that was used for feasts, and a fireplace at the end. There was nothing but ash in it now. It was mainly used in winter, when the air was cold and breath turned to mist. The skin of a bear rested on the floor, its mouth gaping open. It was upon this that Blair stood. You wish to see me father, Blair said. The seat beside Afe was empty. His mother was evidently on an errand. Afe leaned forward. Unlike Blair, who was clad in a loose shirt with a cloth draped around his hips. Aif was wearing a heavy dark cloak, which contrasted with his long white hair and bushy eyebrows. Beady blue eyes peered at Blair from behind this eyebrows, and when Aif spoke, his words tumbled out in a quick stream. I see ye Habenut hunting again. Another successful day, I see. Aye, Fayther. How long do ye expect to keep up this behaviour, Blair? I dunno can which you mean father, Blair said, still on one knee. You run aboot that forest just as you did when you were a bairn. I had hoped you would have grown up by new. There are mere important things for you to concern yourself with, Blair, and you should be turning your eyes towards them. Blair knew exactly what Aif meant. It was not the first time they had had a conversation like this. I go oot hunting for the clan. I bring back food for everyone to eat. I always had the well-being of the clan on my mind. Ye may well tell yourself that maybe ye even believe it, but I can it's nay true. Ye run through that forest we you to care in the world, for ye like to imagine ye're free. Ye're the eldest son of a laird. Ye ha ne'er been free, I've said. The words stung Blair. I ha indulged ye fur long enough, Blair. Ye canny shirk your responsibilities any longer. I am... I am getting older every day. I've said, the words wheezing out of him. Blair looked up and saw his father not as the chief of the clan, but as an elderly man. You speak foolishly, Fayther. You're still in your prime. You're the man who faced down a hundred Englishmen with your small force and drove them away. Your deeds in battle are legendary. They still sing songs of you. You still hear a lot of life in you yet, Blair said. That man you speak of has long since passed. He can stay in the songs. We must face the truth of matters, Blair. Ye you claim you're brave, yet ye hide from this one inexorable truth. No, Father, I dare nay hide. I simply dare nay believe it. There is much life left in ye. Ye should nay give up. Ye were famed for your determination. Ne'er did ye believe in defeat. It was your spirit that helped us drive the English away. I dare nay ken how much longer I can go on. This clan, it needs a strong leader to carry the burden of duty. I had done my best to raise ye and forge ye into that leader, but I, I fear I have failed somewhere along the way. I dare nay ken why ye choose to turn away from me so often, but I must implore ye to be mindful of your duty as my son. All ye ever talk about is duty, father. I dare nay turn away from ye. I turn towards my life. 
I canny be content to sit by and wait for the world to come to me. I canny sit in this throne day by day. At least ye had glorious memories to entertain ye. I had nothing but unfilled dreams. Ye punish me for nay having had the opportunity to live as a warrior. Am I nay allowed to live my life as I choose? Nah, I've said. The answer took Blair by surprise. Lesser men can be free. Great men are tied by honour. You're nay the first to struggle with this, nor will you be the last. But I need to make an effort to make you see that you canny spend your days running through the forest. Your people need you. The clan is safe, Fayther. There are no enemies to fight. The English hae nay attacked for years. There is no need for me today all ye ask. I shall lead when I am needed, but until then I am due a life of my own. And wit of your future, I've replied calmly. Hey, you spent any time thinking about the woman you wish to marry? There are many fine girls in this clan, or I can reach out to the other clans should you wish. I will meet my future when I am ready, Fayther, and nay a moment before. We are often ne'er ready, Blair. Things happen that we canny control. Ye must prepare yourself. I am preparing myself, Fayther. Instead of sitting in that chair, I am out there hunting, doing something useful for this clan. I will day all ye ask, but in my own time, and I shall nay be rushed, Blair said defiantly, rising to his feet once again. I have spent all day hunting. I am going to bathe in the stream before the feast tonight. I wish sometimes that you would simply let me be and trust that I am a life well in hand. And I wish you could see that the world is bigger than just your life, I've said, sighing heavily. Blair stormed out of the room, wishing that his father did not have such an effect on him. It seemed as though they were locked in this fight. His father wanted him to go one way, while Blair wanted to go another, and there seemed to be no resolution until one of them broke. Chapter 3 Charles offered Rosemary a hand into the carriage. The black carriage was being driven by two horses. Her chest was placed in the rear, along with some food for the journey. Sarah, Rosemary's handmaiden, was already in the carriage. It shouldn't be too long of a journey, Rosemary, Charles said reassuringly, and Harold is expecting you. The road is straight and there should be no delays. I am sure everything will be fine, Father. You do not have anything to worry about. I know, but you cannot blame a father for fretting. You are the most precious thing to me, he said, still having hold of her hand. Rosemary looked down at him and was filled with love as she gazed into his eyes. She could see the red rivers that stretched across the whites of his eyes, glistening with tears. Her father had never been a man to show much emotion, but she assumed that he would weep once she left. I feel guilty for leaving you in this big house alone. You should have company other than servants. I shall be fine, Rosemary. It is time for you to go and live your life. Have the adventure that you always wanted. Make me proud, and I look forward to seeing you again soon once you are married. I look forward to seeing you too, Father. I love you, and I shall miss you terribly. I love you too. Remember, your mother is watching down on you. I can never forget, Rosemary said. She leaned out of the carriage to give her father one last kiss on the cheek, and then she settled into her seat. She heard the coachman shout, Hya! The horses pulled away at a canter. Rosemary locked herself to the window for as long as she could as she watched her old life recede into the distance. The manor house in which she had spent all of her eighteen years loomed behind her father, who looked smaller and smaller as she was driven away. Charles waved to her and blew her kisses. Rosemary waved back, long after it was possible for him to see. Soon all she could see were the ivy-covered walls. Rosemary looked up to her room. In a sense it was as though her younger self was still gazing out of that window, looking out at the vast world around her watching her present self disappear into the wider world. It wasn't how she had always dreamed of leaving, though, and in fact her stomach swam with nerves. The carriage trundled along, jerking slightly as the wheels caught on stones and pebbles strewn across the road. Eventually, Rosemary had to pull herself away from the window and prevent herself from looking at the life she was leaving behind. 
It would do no good to think about the way she wanted things to be. Some things merely had to be endured. This was her life, and the only question was whether she was going to meet it with dignity or not. Fondling the locket against her breast, she thought about how her mother and father had conducted themselves and knew that she was going to make them proud no matter what. Above the carriage, in the sky, a bird flew. Rosemary couldn't help but look at the bird with envy. Its black wings were like slashes against the blue sky and it soared free. Unlike Rosemary, it could go anywhere it wanted and do anything it wanted to do. Often she had gazed at birds and wished that she could fly through the air, off to new lands. As she thought this, the carriage entered the woodland and it was plunged in shadow, sheltered from the heat of the sun. How are you feeling? Sarah asked. Sarah, like Rosemary, was a demure girl, although a little plainer looking than Rosemary was. Sarah was of a similar age, and the two of them had known each other for so long that they were more akin to sisters than anything else. Sarah was a shy girl, never one to speak out of turn or to offend. She was sitting with her hands in her lap, smiling weakly at Rosemary. Rosemary was glad of her company on this journey, and was the only person with whom she felt she could share the truth. Honestly? I am... reluctant. I always knew that this was the likely course of my life, but now it is happening I find myself wishing that I had more time. Time to do what? To explore the world, to have an adventure. I feel as though my life has been written out for me, and I am merely turning the pages. I am sure it will not turn out to be as dull as you think. Marriage comes with its own excitements, Sarah said, blushing. Rosemary chuckled softly. Perhaps you are right. And Lord Harold is said to be an impressive man. It is an honour to be chosen for his wife. I am sure it is, but I can't help but feel that I want to be known as more than his wife. What more is there? There is a whole world out there, Sarah, Rosemary said, her eyes gleaming with excitement. A world filled with dangers. Do not forget about the threat across the border. There has not been even the slightest hint of a skirmish with those brutes, Rosemary said, but it would be interesting to meet one. Do you think the rumours that they eat their own kind to be true? That they file their teeth to a point, and that some of them even turn into animals? I... I do not wish to think about it, Sarah said, shifting uncomfortably in her seat. Rosemary immediately regretted her zeal. I apologise, Sarah. I did not mean to bring up those painful memories. You are forgiven. One of these days I shall have to learn to be less sensitive. The attack was a long time ago, and there is nothing I can do to stop it. I do dread even thinking about coming face to face with one of those monsters, however. I do not imagine I would even be able to stand. You are stronger than you think, and you do not have anything to apologise for. Unlike you, I do not have anyone to blame for my mother's death, so I cannot imagine what it is like for you to know that they are out there beyond the border waiting. Do you ever think that they will attack again? My father did not think so. He said that we bloodied their noses the last time, and if they have the sense they'll stay to their land and not bother with ours. Of course they aren't no for their brains, so you never know. In that case I am glad Lord Harold has quite the force at his command. Living so close to the border must take its toll on the nerves. I hardly think we will be sitting on the border, Sarah. Once we are in the manor it will be just like our lives have always been, except instead of answering to my father, I shall have to answer to Lord Harold. Then I hope we reach the estate as quickly as possible. I have heard all sorts of stories about what lies in the woods. My mother told me the same stories, and they are all just silly imaginings made to send little children to sleep. There are more things to be afraid of out there, like the feeling that one's life is not in one's control. I would have thought you were beyond such fears now, Rosemary. There is no other way you can live life. That is not entirely true. I have often wondered what would happen if I ran away and fended for myself. With all due respect, I do not think you would last long. 
you have not exactly had much experience of being self-sufficient. Rosemary arched an eyebrow. Sarah was only ever this candid with her, and even then she was not usually so insulting, but Rosemary put it down to the girl's nerves and fragile spirit. Sarah had not had an easy life at all. Her parents were killed in a Scottish raid when she was younger, and Rosemary's father had taken Sarah into their care, giving her food and shelter in return for Sarah being Rosemary's handmaid. Sarah had always been haunted by the death of her parents, and had never been able to escape that tragic memory from her youth. For her, life was always viewed through a lens of fear, and the worst fate she could imagine was to be at the mercy of those who had killed her parents. However, Rosemary found the idea exciting. Not that she would reveal such to Sarah, of course, but secretly the thought of being lost beyond the border gave Rosemary a thrill to which nothing could compare. Never before had she met a Scot. She had only heard stories, but the tales of the brutish barbarians elicited a swift beating of the heart. It was a world entirely unlike the one she had known, and for just one moment in her life she would have liked to experience something outside of her usual sphere. I believe I would fare much better than anyone would give me credit for, Rosemary said haughtily. Just because I am a lady, it does not mean that I cannot take care of myself, and all I'm saying is that I would like the opportunity to explore that side of me. I pray that you do not get the chance. What do you think Lord Harold is going to be like? she asked. Rosemary felt the attempt to change the subject was weak, but accepted it. The carriage continued to roll along, jerking this way and that as the road apparently did not get any smoother. Outside, long branches of trees reached down to brush against the carriage. The clapping sound often made Sarah jump. Rosemary felt for the coachman, who did not have the shelter of the carriage to protect him from the lashing branches. My father has a high opinion of him, and that is what matters. Apparently he is educated, well-bred, and is the sort of man that can live on the border without being afraid. He is a hardy sort, and one that I would be proud of marrying, if all that is accurate. Why would it not be? In my experience, albeit limited, men have a tendency to inflate the impressions they give each other. I do not think my father would marry me to someone unworthy, but I am not foolish enough to think that Harold will be exactly like my father describes. I merely hope that he is a decent sort, and will treat me with kindness. He is an English lord. I am sure that that behaviour is natural for him, Sarah said, shocked that Rosemary could think otherwise. Rosemary afforded herself a small smile. She was not in any way worldly, but when compared with Sarah, she had a wider outlook on the world. Her heart was filled with trepidation about Harold, for she worried that he would not be the gentleman her father thought. When her darkest fears took hold, she felt as though she was being led into a trap, and the woods around her were tempting an escape. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Chapter 4 Blair stood in the stream. The water came up to his waist, lapping against his sculpted abdominal muscles. He reached down with his wide hands and scooped up some of the crystal water, throwing it over his face. The cool water fell down his body, trickling over his muscles, before it fell into the water again. It was hard enough for Blair not to thrash in the water after speaking with his father. The old man always expected so much of him, and Blair wanted something else. When he was younger, Blair had always seen himself as a mighty warrior, wanting to go out and fight the English but the wars had ended and his generation had little glory to find. His father spoke of leadership, but what was there to lead? These humble people who lived off the land. It was a story hardly worthy of song. At some point Blair knew that he would have to claim leadership from his father and take his seat at the throne, but as far as Blair was concerned he wanted to leave it as long as possible. He dipped down into the water and washed off all the remnants of the hunt. When he emerged again, he shook his head, and the water sprayed off his hair. I see you were successful at the hunt yet again, Deirdre said. Her slender body leaned against a tree. 
Red hair flowed down to the middle of her back, covering her chest, and her green eyes gleamed as they lingered on Blair's impressive body. Blair glanced towards her, then continued bathing himself. There are few beasts that can challenge me, he said without any hint of arrogance, for it was just a simple fact. Mibi nay beasts, but there are some challenges ye have yet to face, she said, smiling wickedly. I noticed ye storming out of the castle. Are you always going to keep your eyes on me? Deirdre shrugged and pulled a flower up from the ground, idly picking its petals away. Until I find something else with which to occupy my time. I assume ye had another discussion with your faither. That man is as stubborn as the day is long. I can ne'er get him to see my point of view. I'm sure he feels the same way about ye. Be careful of your words, Deirdre. Ye may think ye have a special place with me, but we were childhood friends, na mare. At this, Deirdre threw the flower onto the floor. Her expression darkened as she stared at Blair with daggers in her eyes. Na mare, we shared our first intimacy. That kiss sealed our love and ye had done nothing to even acknowledge it. It's as though it didn't even happen for ye. Of course it happened in Deirdre, but it was mere child's play. Ye can ye expect me to offer ye anything more than that. I can, and I day, Deirdre said simply. While ye have been off running around the forest, I was talking with your mither and feyther. They both agree that the best thing for ye is to settle down and think about the future. You're no longer a youth and canny act so recklessly. I can act as I please. Nah, ye canny. Ye seem to think that because you're Aif's son, ye hae the freedom today as ye wish. Nothing could be further from the truth. You're tied to this clan, and it will one day be your duty to lead it. I believe your father wants to hand over leadership to ye new, but he is afraid that you're nay ready. Can ye nay take pity on the old man? Do ye nay see how frail he is? How weak? If there was any danger, he would nay be able to face it himself. The clan needs the blood of the young Tay Prosper. It needs our blood, and the blood of our children. I do nay ken why you're so intent on turning your back on our future, she spat. Blair looked at her and wished that he was no in so vulnerable a position. He snarled, and then moved through the water, walking out. The water dripped off his naked body as he reached for his clothes and covered his exposed flesh. Deirdre's eyes dropped down to take in every inch of his masculinity, but it only stalled her for a few moments. Day nay speak of my father in that manner. He is a great man. And great men do nay die. Great men gain immortality through the deeds and their glory. My father's memory will endure long after he has passed from this world, but his day will nay come for a long time. He merely looks old because he continues to sit in that chair rather than riding out into the world. If the English came riding over the moors, my father would be the first to leap up and ride out to meet them with his blade. Deirdre looked at him with pity. Blair, I dare want to fight with ye. I am only trying to make ye see what is best for the clan. Ye haken all your life that you're to be the leader after your father. Why are you so intent on fighting it new? When ye can work that out, I might think about marrying you, Blair said, pushing past her and away. Deirdre stood in shock, but she did not pursue him. The day was beginning to die, the sun relinquishing the celestial throne to the moon. The sky burned orange, and Blair returned to the camp, where people were making preparations for the feast. The beast he slew earlier had been skinned and was now roasting over a large fire. The smell of sizzling meat made his stomach rumbly, and he was looking forward to tearing off the meat with his teeth. Still, it was difficult to look forward to anything when he had both his father and Deirdre hounding him about the man he should be. Looking around, he felt different from these people. He was supposed to be the one to lead them, but all he wanted to do was escape from his duty. They were all so happy and seemed content with their lives, but Blair was always looking to the horizon, looking to see what else was out there. Alone, he kept to the edge of the camp and sat on a log, brooding. His back was to the castle. People knew him well enough by now to avoid him and his short temper, but he could hear their jovial shouts and their laughter. They were happy and they shouted loud thanks to him for providing the meat for their feast, yet it was not enough for him. This place, 
It didn't feel like home. It always felt like there should be something more, and yet he was unable to understand where that feeling came from. A lot of his frustration came from these confusing feelings, and he wished he could be more certain of himself. I brought you this, before there's none left, Drew said, handing him a thick steak. Blair took it in his hands and bit into it. The meat was succulent and tender. He ripped a chunk off with his teeth and chewed happily, closing his eyes with satisfaction. You chose a fine animal, Drew said, because I hunted it all day. In my experience, the longer the hunt, the mare satisfying the meal. Is that true with women, Tay? The smile instantly fell from Blair's face. Deirdre spoke with ye. Nay, directly. I was passing as she marched back from the stream and muttered about someone being impossible. By the way she spoke, I knew that she could only mean ye. That woman is nay happy unless she has something to moan about. She does hear point, though. How long are you going to wait? For wit? Does everyone seek to control my life? Can I nay enjoy some moments of peace? Of course you can. But brother, there is a reason why all of us are talking to ye about this. And wit is that? Fayther is ill. Blair remained silent. I ken that ye didn't want to face it, Drew continued, but ye must. The clan needs ye to be strong. Fayther can he continue indefinitely. At some point his strength will slip away from him and... Nah, Fayther is strong. He endured the war. He can endure this. I will nay entertain thoughts of him dying. He will live for many years yet. You're all merely fussing over him. Just because he is old doesn't he mean that death is coming for him. Blair, I ken how ye feel. Believe me, I didn't want to think about it any more than ye, but what you're doing isn't he healthy. Ye canna keep running off every day. One day you're going to come back and... Didn't he say it? Drew didn't have to. Blair knew what he was going to say. In truth, it had been on his mind for a long time, far longer than he cared to admit. Often his father could be heard in the night, coughing violently. He was old and frail, far from the mighty warrior he had been in his youth. There is always one hunter greater than ye, one hunter that ne'er misses his mark, Drew said. I am aware that Faither will die, but that does ne mean I have to accept it. It means exactly that. We have lived in peace for years new, and these people deserve to ken that they're going to be cared for, that the clan will endure even after our father passes away. There are many things ye can run from Blair, but this is nay one of them. I am coming to ye because you're my brother. We have always been able to share our thoughts with one another, but this path you're on, it threatens us all. Blair chewed on the meat, finding it difficult to enjoy it any longer. He wiped some juice from his mouth. Day you remember when we were young and used to dream about what lay beyond the border, he said. Of course. How could I forget? We were going to be warriors when we were of age and join the fight against the cowardly English. Those days ne'er came. The war ended before we were old enough. I was always frustrated that we ne'er got to test ourselves against the English. You ken, I heard Patrick and some of his boys had a skirmish with some English folk ne'er long ago. They clashed steel and came back alive, but Patrick said it had been a tough fight. We would have made short work of them, Drew. It often seems to me that war was a simpler time. Things made mere sense. Warriors fought. A leader could lead his clan on the battlefield and fight for a worthy cause. What is a leader, Te De Nu? These people ken how to harvest crops, how to manage the fields. Whitmare is there. Te inspire them. Te let them ken that someone will be there if danger falls upon us. Your problem is that ye have always looked to the past or the future. Maybe ye should look at the present for a change, Drew said. Ye high always been the wiser of the two of us, Blair said. Maybe it was unfortunate that ye were born after me. Nea say that Blair, the gods will as they will. Ye were born first because ye hae a role to play that is greater than I. I day myself in a dishonour by admitting that you're the strongest of us, but that doesn't mean you're flawless. I ken why you're behaving like this. Day ye. I am your brother Blair. I ken you better than you ken yourself. You're afraid of Faither dying. There isn't a shame in that, but you're ne helping matters by running amok in the woods. 
you should be learning from Fether. He has much wisdom to impart to ye, and ye should listen to him, before it's too late. With that he took his leave. Blair looked at the meat in his hand and continued chewing, although he went through the motions without really enjoying the rewards of his labours. The sun had set completely now, and a blanket of stars hung in the sky, accompanied by a full moon. Behind him, a large bonfire crackled and glowed, its warmth spreading through the camp. Blair refused to look at the small castle, not wanting to think about his father sitting on that wooden throne, having his meat torn apart so it was easier for him to manage. He preferred to gaze out towards the border, thinking of the glory days of the past, when he was young and watched his father ride out, wielding his great axe. It had been an impressive sight to see all those warriors swarm across the rolling highlands to crush the English, and had filled Blair's mind with hopes for his own future. The promise of war had never been fulfilled for him, though. He had spent all his life planning and training for it, but relations between the Scottish clans and the English lords had remained cordial, with the exception of a few skirmishes here and there. Blair had been prepared to lead his clan during war and to accept that his father died in battle, but he was not prepared to watch his father die slowly, as old age gradually pulled him into the dark abyss from which there was no return. With this on his mind, Blair tore the meat away from the bone and then threw the bone on the floor. Despite what everyone said, he was not going to be bullied into living a life he didn't want. But that begged the question, what life did he want? What was a man bred for war to do when there was no war? The only thing he could think to do was hunt, so in the darkness he moved away from the safety of home, wanting to feel the fire in his blood again, the simplicity of tracking prey, hoping that he would find a foe worthy of him. Chapter 5 Darkness had set in and the carriage had to stop for the night. Rosemary knew that it would happen, but stepping out in the dark night was something else entirely. Her heart was filled with a mixture of excitement and fear, which was in contrast to Sarah, who was completely afraid. Are you sure we should be camping this close to the border? she fretted. Rosemary insisted that it was fine. There's no other safe place to stay, ma'am, the driver said. By now, Rosemary had learned that his name was George, and he seemed a decent sort. While Sarah had retrieved some food from their supplies, George had been busy gathering firewood and building a fire. Rosemary watched with great interest, for she had never experienced anything like this before, and had George explain exactly what he was doing every step of the way. Once the fire was established, Rosemary and Sarah settled down to enjoy the warmth. The forest was dark, and its shadows flickered with secrets. Rosemary remembered all the stories her mother had told her, and wondered if any of them would come true. I hope that this night passes swiftly, Sarah said. Rosemary invited George to sit and eat with them, but he declined, saying that it was inappropriate. The food was serviceable, but nothing like what she had been used to at home. Are you still sure that you'd like to be out here by yourself? Sarah whispered after they had finished eating. Rosemary smiled slyly. While it was certainly different to what she knew, there was a charm to living to living outside, some kind of innocence that stripped away the complications of modern life. I'm not certain that I would like to live this way for the rest of my life, but I'm glad I'm able to experience it for one night at least, she said. The girls then pulled blankets over themselves and slept by the fire, while George kept watch over them. The ground was hard, but there was something comforting about the fire crackling beside them. Before they fell asleep, Sarah whispered to Rosemary, asking her if she thought George was staying awake to protect them from any Highlanders who might be tempted to steal away two English maidens. Rosemary assured her that such a thing would never happen, and yet a part of her mind was alive with the possibility. It wasn't anything she actually wanted to happen, of course, but the slight chance that it could happen was titillating, and before she was a married woman she allowed herself to enjoy this forbidden desire, knowing that it would never come to pass. Just settling to sleep, Rosemary was disturbed by the sound of horses' hooves and a wagon passing across the road. It came to a halt. 
Rosemary awakened and pushed herself up, shaking Sarah awake. George drew his sword and waved to the girls to stay quiet. They had camped just off the road, not expecting to see any other travellers. A tall man strode forward. He wore chain mail, and his footsteps made heavy sounds as they fell against the ground. What are you doing here? he said sharply. Just stopping over for the night. It's a bit too dark to continue, George replied. Is there anything I can help you with? The tall man examined him and the carriage with an inscrutable gaze, and then looked directly at the girls. His eyes lingered on them for a few moments, but he didn't mention them. No need. I am just on an errand for Lord Flynn. I shall move on. If you hear any strange noises, well, it's nothing, the tall man said. At the mention of Lord Flynn, Sarah almost called out, but Rosemary grabbed her arm and shook her head. She wasn't entirely sure why, but there was an uneasy feeling in her stomach, and Rosemary thought it better to keep quiet and not reveal their true identities. As the wagon passed, she peered out and saw three men in a cage, looking entirely sorry for themselves. The wagon had a banner tied around it, showing Lord Flynn's coat of arms. It was a mighty bull with flames of fire. She locked eyes with one of the men and saw nothing but despondence. George sheathed his sword and walked over to them. I suggest we keep out of their way, keep quiet, and try not pay attention to anything you hear, he said then took his seat upon the carriage again, looking out with more alertness this time. It was easier said than done for Rosemary. Why did you stop me from speaking? Sarah asked in a hushed whisper. Because it was improper. Improper. That man is allied with your future husband. He could have stood guard over us. He could have escorted us to our new home. He can be trusted. Can he? Rosemary challenged. Without doubt. I am not as sure as you. I did not want to show them the truth, for I did not want them to silence us. I believe there is something sinister afoot. And I believe you have quite lost your mind. Forgive my tongue, but you are so eager for an adventure that you would seek out danger. I have half a mind to tell George to get the attention of those men. No, you cannot. I cannot explain why I feel so sure about this, but there is a feeling in my gut. There is something strange afoot, Rosemary said. Sarah huffed and turned around, not wanting to talk about these matters any longer. Her curiosity had been piqued by this occurrence, and she wanted to know more. What had these men done? Why were they being taken to the woods? After making sure that George wasn't looking at her directly, Rosemary slipped the blanket off of her and left it in such a way that it looked as though she was still sleeping. Sarah looked at her. Frightened, pleading silently for Rosemary to stay, but Rosemary was already gone. Sneaking through the trees, Rosemary felt the surge of excitement within her heart. Even if she would only get a night of adventure before she was married, it was still one night. The forest was alive with the sounds of birds tweeting and animals scurrying around, although she was not able to see much in the dim light. She often stumbled over rocks and knocked her knees against tree stumps but she continued forward, undeterred. The dim light actually helped her, for she was able to see a torch burning ahead. Following the fire, she crept forward and stayed just on the periphery of a small clearing. The wagon had stopped, and the men were all standing there, head hung down. One of the other men was tying ropes to the branch of a tree, flinging it over, and then tying a hole. The tall man who had approached George spoke his clipped words loud and clear through the stillness of the night. You three men have been charged with treason, theft and deviant behaviour. You have all been found guilty and shall now serve your sentence, as decreed by Lord Flynn. The three men protested. One of them claimed he only stole a loaf of bread to feed his family. Another one claimed that all he had done was sing a song his mother had taught him, not knowing that it was a Scottish song ridiculing the English. The other man remained silent, staring into nothingness. The men were strung up, ropes placed around their necks. The tall man seemed to relish his duty. Rosemary felt ill. She wanted to look away, but she knew she would be doing these men a disservice. Was Harold Flynn, her future husband, really petty enough to hang these men for such trivial offences? 
What kind of man would do that? With one command, the men were hanged. The first to go was the man who stole a loaf of bread. His feet dangled in the air, searching for any kind of purchase, while his face turned a deep shade of purple. Rosemary was glad that it was night, for the horrors were cloaked in the darkness. While the first man was gurgling, the second man was still pleading, as though there was some hope for him to survive. Soon enough he was just the same as the first man, clinging on to life desperately, until it slipped away from him. Rosemary was filled with fear, and wished that she could do something to help. It didn't seem right that these men were being killed out in the forest like this. What of their families? What of the right to defend themselves? Filled with horror, she stood by, making as little noise as possible, but soon the two bodies had stopped writhing and were simply hanging limply, held up by the rope. That left the third man. The tall man, Flynn's guard, walked up to the man, his hand on his sword. That just leaves you. At least you're not the simpering sort like they are. Haven't you anything to say for yourself? The silent man slowly turned his gaze down onto the tall man. Would it make any difference at all, he said. Rosemary's breath caught in her throat. The man was Scottish. Not for the likes of you, but I thought I'd extend the courtesy. You can he can he keep getting away with this. Eventually we're going to retaliate, or is that wit the esteemed Lord Flynn wants? What Lord Flynn wants is no concern of you. You're a brute, and you deserve everything that's coming to you. As de ye, the Scotsman said softly. This seemed to enrage the tall man, who withdrew his sword and stabbed the Scot in the stomach. A red stain bloomed across his tunic, but he did not yell out in pain. He gazed towards Rosemary, who gasped. The colour drained from her face. She turned on her heels and ran, but the tall man heard her movements and gave chase. With her heart thundering in her chest, she turned on her heels and fled. Behind her, she heard the tall man bark orders at the other soldiers around him, telling them to go back to the carriage and make sure nobody spoke of what they had seen. Rosemary's heart was filled with fear, and she knew she must make it back to Sarah. However, in the darkness she was not entirely sure of the direction she should take, and there was no time to stop and find her bearings as the tall man with the blood-stained sword was chasing after her, yelling at her to stop. The ground seemed to shake under his heavy boots, and if Rosemary hadn't been terrified she would have wept. Those men, those poor men, didn't seem like they deserved to die. Her mind whirled as she ran at breakneck speed through the forest, trying to understand why Flynn would have ordered the deaths of these men in such a clandestine manner. Rosemary had always been raised to believe that criminals should have a chance to defend themselves, and she had never known a hanging to take place in secret, not when people were sure that the accused were guilty. Her instincts were sharp, and she was sure that there was something more going on, something that spoke very badly of Flynn's character. The last thing she wanted was to be married to a brute who would order such callous deaths, and the overriding thought in her heart was that this was her one chance to escape. To be married to a man like Flynn would be akin to being locked in a prison, just as those men were being kept in a cage. The only difference between them would be that while their deaths were quick, Rosemary's would be slow and gradual, with little hope of mercy. She needed to get to Sarah and tell George to drive straight back to her father. Then they could decide what to do. She could not marry Flynn now, not after what she had seen. How could she look into the eyes of such a man and profess her love for him? Always in the back of her mind would be the silent gaze of the final man, the one who had seemed to look through her as the life bled out of him. Stop! Halt your flight and answer to me, the tall man called out. Rosemary turned this way and that. In one moment she was sure of the way she was going, then in another the only thing she was sure of was that she was lost. The trees all looked the same in the darkness. Her lungs burned. All she wanted was to rest and be safe. But behind her the tall man continued to pursue, hacking away at trees with his sword. You shall not escape with your life if you continue to flee. Stop and face me. I may show you mercy. She doubted if he'd even believe that she was Rosemary Brambley, 
but she could not speak anyway, for she was out of breath. Sweat poured from her temples. Her gaze peered into the darkness, sure that the road was going to present itself soon and she would see the salvation of the carriage, but she only seemed to be getting deeper and deeper into the woods. The trees thickened and the darkness was growing more powerful. Her muscles ached. Rosemary knew that she would not be able to continue for much longer, and her steps started to falter. Once that man caught up to her, she knew that her life would be over. Perhaps one night of adventure hadn't been worth it after all. Chapter 6 Blair was skulking through the woods, brooding as he was wont to do. He wore a short sword by his side, but his weapon of choice was a javelin, for hunting at least. It was always preferable to kill prey before they had even seen you, rather than getting locked in melee combat. Not that he figured he'd need much use of it tonight. He'd intended to hunt, but in truth he wanted to get away from the camp and all the pressures of his duty and his responsibility. Drew and Deirdre can talk to me of Faither's demise as much as they wish. Am I the only one who has faith in my father? It can he day him good to hear everyone expecting him to die. If he would only seize life himself and step off his throne for one instant, he would see that there was still much for him to accomplish. If only he would join me out here, rather than chastise me for my actions. Then he would be reminded of the fire that ran through his blood. We would run across the highlands as a father and son should. The great Afen Blair fighting for justice and honour. It would be a glorious life. But it's nay the life I will lead, Blair said with regret, to nobody in particular. I wish you could be by my side, father, hunting with me. I will ne'er admit that you're in your last throes of life. Ye has simply accepted it because others he told you so. Mither and Drew he always worried far too much over ye. We all ye he done in battle. It's nay right that ye should be remembered as a frail old man. Ye should be out here with me, vibrant and alive. It was easier to be out here, free from everything that waited for him at home. He had never asked to be born the eldest chief's son and in truth he was convinced that Drew would have made a better leader than he ever would. Drew was rational, while Blair was hot-headed. It seemed as though he always made the wrong decisions, and his father had never been happy with him. From a young age Blair had wanted glory, so sought out combats and hunts. His mind turned to a gathering of the clans when he was fourteen, just after the war had ended. Blair had been at the height of his arrogance and frustration, annoyed that the glory of war had been denied to him. While the clans had united for the war against the English, it was an uneasy alliance, and they had gathered to discuss the resolution of pacts that had been made during the fighting. Blair had no interest in that, of course, nor did most of the other children. They had been nourished on deeds of glory and wanted to live some of those moments themselves. Not all the clans looked at each other with the same level of respect, and Blair was subjected to taunting from some of the other children. Enraged, he grappled them and cracked their heads together, leaving no one standing. The men had all been impressed by his showing as a warrior, but his father was disappointed. He told Blair that violence was not always the answer, and that he should not respond quickly with his fists when words would do. Blair had never taken that lesson to heart. It seemed easy for him to fight. He was good at it, and so far his prowess had not been matched by anything he had encountered, man or beast. Every part of him was bred for war, but he had been born a few years too late to be of any use. It was only tradition holding his parents to the idea that he had to be the leader anyway. Perhaps there was some way for him to relinquish the throne to Drew. Then he could be free to live his life the way he wanted. Should I be ashamed of wanting to turn away from Ma destiny in such a way? It has ne'er felt right to me, like an uncomfortable cloak around Ma's shoulders. Drew has always been mere reasonable than I. I was born for the wrong time. I was born for war. Why can nobody see that? The only time I feel alive is out in the forest, with the wind whipping through Ma hair trailing the scent of Ma prey. There were times when he looked at the wild beasts he hunted with envy. They could stretch their sinews and gallop through the world without any thought to what they needed to be. They could live wherever they wished, 
and mate with whomever they wanted. Blair's thoughts turned to Deirdre and the kiss they had shared those many moons ago. It had been a chaste kiss, barely a brush on the lips, but for Deirdre it had evidently left a lasting impression. Blair could not say the same for himself, and he wondered if there was anything wrong with him. Women of the clan had never interested him that much. They were all fine to look at, strong women with child-bearing hips, but since he was surrounded by them every day of his life they seemed ordinary to him, and they did not excite him at all. The thought of marrying was abhorrent to him as well, just another shackle to keep him tied down. One day perhaps he would like a family, but he was still young and had much of his life to enjoy yet. It felt to him as though his parents were forcing him to grow up too quickly, to steal away his future and replace it with their own. If they thought Blair was going to accept this without resisting, they were sorely mistaken. Not knowing how long he had been in the forest, Blair wandered aimlessly, deep in thought. He was distracted by the occasional sounds of birds and beasts coming out of their hiding places, although none of them were big enough to hunt. He kept an eye out for any supernatural beings as well, although he didn't expect to see any fairies or pixies. The night was temperate, and the air was cool on his skin. Back at home he was sure that his family were shaking their heads over him, wondering when he was going to do as they wished. His father was most likely ruminating about where he had gone wrong over the years, and Deirdre was probably cursing his name. Sometimes he felt it would be easier if he simply ran away completely and lived as a wild man, with no name and no home. But he had never been able to face that destiny. It did pull to him, though, the call of the wild. It was only a matter of time until he listened. Now, deep in the woods, Blair knew that he was probably close to the English border. The southern lands had always held a mystique for him. Tales of the English had reached him, but it was difficult to know which were fact and which were fiction. Did death lie in wait for him? Some people spoke of Englishmen waiting at every point of the border, ready to stab the Highlanders as soon as they even approached the border. They often said that English people had hooked noses and crooked teeth, that they were a product of inbreeding, and that many of them were fat and lazy due to them thinking of themselves as lords and ladies. Blair liked to joke about them as much as anyone, but he knew the truth must have gone deeper than that. They can't have been that fat and lazy if they had fought bitterly with the Highlanders and drawn their fair share of blood. Blair had always wanted to test himself against an Englishman, and almost wished that one of them had been wandering around the woods. The closer he got to the border, the more he realised it was probably better if he headed back to the castle. Perhaps he could placate his father by telling the old man that he would think on what he said, and he could make things up with Deirdre as well. It was difficult to resist fate's pull when it was only pulling him in one direction. Tiredness was beginning to set in. Blair wondered if it wasn't just easier for him to forget about all his own desires and give everyone else what they wanted. Perhaps with time, he would even grow used to being the perfect son. It still did not sit well in his heart, though. He was a warrior, and he should have been destined for far greater things than sitting on a wooden throne while the world passed him by. Just before he decided to turn back, he heard a loud rustling. His heart leapt with excitement and his eyes gleamed. What manner of beast was approaching? By the sound of it, it was mighty for sure and would provide a great challenge. Finally, Blair said, this will prove enough to take my mind off my woes. If I come back with something even mightier than the stag, I may remind my father of wit glory he is denying himself. Blair licked his lips, relishing the thought of battle. He pulled out his javelin and peered into the darkness, looking at the direction from which it approached. Perhaps slaying a beast would provide some balm for his aching soul. Steadying himself, Blair readied for an attack and kept his eyes peeled. He breathed slowly and deeply, trying to calm his heart so that he maintained control of his actions. Being a skilled warrior was no easy thing. Managing the bloodlust was challenging, for it was all too easy to lose oneself to the rage and be blinded to the surroundings. A clear head was needed, and the anger needed to be focused. Blair was ready to face whatever came upon him, his muscles were taut, the javelin was primed to be hurled forward, 
but then the beast appeared, and it was not what he had been expecting at all. Through the trees a woman sprinted. She wore a white dress which was pulled up as she ran, and her hair was matted to her face as sweat poured down. Blair kept hold of the javelin and was so taken aback by the appearance of this woman that he almost failed to notice the tall man chasing her, gnashing his teeth, yelling at her to stop. When the woman saw Blair, she screamed and fell, cowering on the floor. Blair looked up to see the tall man rush forward. Blair had always wanted to test himself against an Englishman. Throwing his javelin to the floor, Blair unsheathed his sword. The blade of his enemy's weapon was already covered in blood. Leave us be brute, the tall man said. I've already killed one of your kind tonight. Then you're deserving of my wrath, Blair said. It had been a long time since he had been in a sword fight, but feeling the weapon in his hands was calming. Strength flowed through him, and he knew that the man standing before him was already dead. The tall man was dressed in chain mail and was evidently experienced with the weapon as he charged in first, the blade moving swiftly through the air. In the darkness it was easy to lose sight of it, especially as it only caught the silver moonlight occasionally. Blair stepped back and soon the Song of Steel began. Blade clashed against blade so fiercely that sparks almost flew through the air. Submit, the Englishman said through gritted teeth. Their blades were locked together, and the two warriors were straining, trying to push each other away. Blair had the advantage of youth and a ferocity that was unmatched. He summoned all his strength and roared, pushing the Englishman away. Blair didn't know why he had been chasing this woman nor did he particularly care. What mattered was that there was finally someone against whom he could test his skill, and he was not going to pass up the chance to spill English blood. Nair, Blair replied. He lunged forward with his boot, kicking the man in the side before going on the offensive himself. His sword slashed through the air. The Englishman deftly managed to avoid his blows, but the longer the fight went on, the more enraged Blair became. His sword crashed down upon the Englishman's over and over again, clattering the metal. The Englishman doubled over. Blair's roar rumbled through the woods. He could feel the reverberations of his blows shaking through his arms, but his strength did not waver. Blair brought his sword crashing down until the Englishman was on his knees. I submit, he pleaded. Blair paused for a moment, and that was all the Englishman needed. Blair found a handful of dirt being thrown into his face. He stumbled back, clawing at his eyes quickly, blinking furiously to try and regain his sight. The Englishman was more agile than Blair thought, for he was on his knees quickly, and the song of steel began again. Blair shook away the remainder of the dirt. This time he was truly angry, and he was going to reward the Englishman's dirty trick with death. With great speed, Blair twisted around to avoid one of the Englishman's blows and slashed the man's stomach across with his sword. The Englishman looked shocked and confused as he looked at the long line of blood, but he was still standing. Blair had seen this sort of thing before, though, a beast that was in its last throes of life thrashing out with everything it had in a desperate attempt to cling to life. It was in these moments when Blair knew he had won. The Englishman's strokes were wild now that the strength was leaving his body. When he tried to speak, blood spilled from his mouth. Blair watched him, unimpressed. If this was the best the English could offer, then it was a wonder they had ever been able to hold their own in the war. Blair deflected a weak swing, then with two hands rammed his sword through the middle of the Englishman, letting the blade linger inside him for a moment before pulling it out. The man slumped forward face down in the dirt, his arms and legs splaying over the ground. Blair smiled at himself as he looked down at his own blade, glad that his years of hunting had not been wasted. There were few thrills better than besting a man in combat, and for the first time in his life Blair felt complete, as though he was entirely sure of what his purpose was. The air was now thick with the smell of blood and death, but it was the sweetest smell Blair had ever known. Leaning over his vanquished foe, he wiped his sword on the grass and chuckled to himself. Stay right there, a shrill voice said. Blair turned to see the woman crouching, holding his javelin. The tip was pointed straight at him. 
She was almost beautiful enough to be a fairy. Chapter 7 Rosemary's body was aching all over and her nerves were frayed. Her hands shook and the heavy javelin trembled. Most of the strength had been drained from her body and it was taking all of her remaining strength to hold on to the weapon. There was a mixture of confusion in her heart. On the one hand, she was thankful that her life had been saved, but now she was at the mercy of this brutish Highlander. His physique was impressive, of that there was no doubt. As slivers of moonlight broke through the gaps in the trees, she could see his broad, tall body and the muscles that rippled all over it. His dark hair came to his shoulders, but his face bore a terrible visage. Locked in combat, she had seen the rage overcome him, and it seemed as though the ferocity of the Highlanders had not been an exaggeration. Flynn's man was dead, his blood seeped into the ground. Rosemary was truly alone. The Highlander turned to face her. From her vantage point he towered above her, and her eyes widened with fear. Rosemary's efforts to appear brave were futile. She jabbed the javelin towards him, hoping to be threatening, but the Scotsman threw back his head and laughed. In spite of the fact that she had just seen this barbarian slay the experienced warrior, Rosemary was incensed by his reaction. Overwhelmed by exhaustion, with her nerves frayed, she rose to her feet and again jabbed the javelin towards him. Her thrust was weak, though, and he easily batted it away. With a swift movement he put his large, brutish hands around the shaft of the javelin and yanked it away from her. Rosemary's strength was no match for his. "'Ye should nay hold a weapon ye de nay ken how to use,' he said in a thick brogue, a deep voice that sent a tingle running down her spine. She almost felt guilty for the way it made her feel, for the primal desire that made her heart quicken. No, this man was a brute, a murderer, a Scot. She should be afraid. You just killed that man, she said in a trembling voice. Ye had nay yet said thank ye. Rosemary's lips were locked at that. What are you going to do now, she said, still not willing to thank him for killing a man. That depends on whether you thank me or nay, he said. The man still hadn't moved, but there was something radiating from him a magnetic aura that she found impossible to resist. The fearful part of her mind told her that she should run, but there was a part of her heart that told her to stay. She considered what to say next, but deep in the forest by herself, she was more vulnerable than she ever had been before. A few moments ago she had been chased by a man she was sure would kill her. At least this Highlander hadn't made any motion to do that, although there were some things worse than death. Thank you, she said through gritted teeth. The man nodded, seeming to accept her gratitude. He held out a hand, offering to help her up. It wasn't the type of gesture she had come to expect from a Scotsman. Tentatively, she held out her dainty hand. It was dwarfed by his. He was like a giant compared to her. With little effort, he hauled her up. Smoothing down her skirt, Rosemary looked around at the surrounding area wondering how far off course she was. What are you doing out here? he said. That is none of your business. He looked down at the fallen man. I'd like to ken if I killed him for a good reason or nay. I wasn't aware people like you needed a reason to kill anyone, she said, instantly regretting it when he glared at her, bristling with animosity. It was a good reason, she added softly. The ordeal to which she had been subjected suddenly overwhelmed her, and she felt sorrow flowing through her body. Although she tried to stop them, she was unable to prevent tears from flowing down her cheeks. Turning away from him to hide her shame, she sobbed quietly, quickly wiping away her tears. Rosemary felt an arm on her shoulder, a surprisingly gentle touch for such an enormous strong man. I'm nae going to hurt ye if that's what ye think. Isn't that what you people do? As in Highlanders? Rosemary nodded softly, still not turning to look at him. We did many things, but we didn't harm unarmed women, even English women. Ma name is Blair. What's yours? Rosemary, she said. Her voice still trembled. Her body shuddered. 
She felt so weak and powerless and hated herself for it. Tell me what you were doing out here, Rosemary. His voice was commanding, authoritative. Something about the way he spoke made her want to tell him everything. I ran. I saw that man hanged three men. I don't know if they even deserved it. I was on the way to meet my husband when I found out that it was he who ordered the hangings of these men. One of them only stole a loaf of bread. I, I did not know such cruelty was possible. Then you must have lived a sheltered life, Blair said. Rosemary shot a sharp look at him. I have lived a good life, surrounded by love. Whatever this is, is not how life should be. That is the nature of life. Is your husband waiting for you? Yes. I mean, we are not married yet. We were to be married. That man worked for him. I... I do not know how I would be able to face him after this. You should try and breathe. You're exhausted and you're no used to seeing such trauma. Sit down. Oh, my goodness. Sarah, she said, suddenly remembering her handmaiden. Turning, she moved to rush off but was held back by a firm grip. The last thing you want today is run into these forests when it's this dark. You were lucky once, you won't be again. Pressure was placed on her shoulder, and she was pushed down to a log. She found herself willing to follow the man's lead, for her mind was utterly dazed. Stay there for a few moments and collect yourself. I must think on things. If the English are nearby, he said, losing himself in his thoughts. Rosemary still wasn't sure if it was lucky that she had encountered this man, but at least she was still alive, which was more than she would have expected had she been told that she would be accosted by a Highlander alone in the woods. I have to get back to Sarah, she's in danger, Rosemary cried, and wrested herself free from Blair's powerful grip. Undeterred, Rosemary continued walking in the direction from which she thought she came, only to be told by Blair that she was going the wrong way. Glaring at him, she shifted her direction and marched forward. Behind her, she could hear Blair following. You don't have to accompany me, she said haughtily. I can, I dinny, but if I let you go new, you might tell people that I murdered that man. Wars have been declared for lesser things. I can trust you with this. I would never do such a thing. I am grateful for your help, but as far as I am concerned, you would be better returning to your lands. I do not know why you are so close to the border anyway. Were you planning a raid? Were you looking for English women to take back? Blair chuckled to himself. Nah, I was hunting, actually. Hunting? At this time of night? It's been Kent to happen. Anyway, I'm only going to leave ye alone, and when there could be more Englishmen out here. More men to kill, you mean? she asked. Blair responded with silence confirming her suspicions. For all his brutish charm, Rosemary could not forget that he was a barbarian and he was capable of horrible things. It seemed as though she was not going to be rid of him so easily, however, so she kept a couple of paces ahead of him. Even so, secretly, she was glad to have him by her side. There were still dangers lurking in these woods, of which he was one, but it seemed as though he was a danger that was on her side. If there were other Englishmen around that would prove a threat to her, she was sure that Blair could defend her if he was willing to put his life in danger for her again. The odd pair walked on in silence. Rosemary's heart was filled with worry for Sarah. She almost didn't want to return to the carriage in case she saw... Well, it didn't bear thinking about. She was so lost in thought that she was taken aback when Blair pulled her towards him. You're still going the wrong way, he said. Rosemary scowled and looked around her. How can you possibly know that, she asked. Blair pointed to the ground, where she saw a rough path of leaves strewn across and small stains of blood that had dropped from the tall man's sword. Rosemary found it astonishing that Blair could make any of that out amid such darkness, but it was always said that Highlanders had some kind of supernatural blood in them. She looked at him warily. It's just experience. I have spent my whole life hunting. Even in the darkness I can see the signs. It's obvious, if you can witty look fur. 
Blair's words failed to settle Rosemary's nerves. Being along with this man set her on edge. It was difficult to think straight, and not just because of everything else that was going on. She dreaded seeing Sarah again, not wanting to think of her friend who had been as close as a sister, being killed. As they walked along, Rosemary tried to quell the confused feelings in her heart. She had always been brought up to think of Englishmen as honourable and noble, and that the Highlanders were brutes. Yet on this evening the only acts of nobility had been performed by the rugged man that was still standing beside her. The only acts of savagery had been committed by the English. It was hard to have her worldview shaken in such a fundamental way, and all she wished was that she could return to the safety of her bedroom and wake up from this horrible nightmare. Can you tell if we're close to where your carriage was left? Blair asked. Rosemary looked around. She thought back, fighting through the fog in her mind, and there was no chance she would ever forget the horrors she had seen that night. The sights of the hanged men and all around them were etched into her soul, and she knew that she was close. She turned away, however, not wanting to see their bodies hanging there. At least she knew she was close. Rosemary marched in the direction of the carriage, slowing as she approached in case Flynn's guards were there. Blair seemed to understand this, so he pushed in front of Rosemary with his sword drawn, ready to battle anyone who had the misfortune to get in his way. Are you certain this is where your carriage stayed? Blair asked. Rosemary moved forward. Yes, she said, pointing to the ash where the fire had been and the marks left by her and Sarah's sleeping bodies. Yet there was no sign of them at all. Rosemary sank to the ground and buried her face in her hands, weeping uncontrollably. There was no semblance of control over her emotions, for she was too sorrowful. She had lost her best friend, indeed, she had lost her whole life. Chapter 8 When Rosemary had left the small camp, Sarah had been upset. It had been Sarah's duty to keep watch over Rosemary, but Rosemary was always headstrong and always had a strange idea of adventure. Sarah had known from a young age how dangerous the world was, and she had tried to warn Rosemary, but apparently she had not tried hard enough. As soon as George realised that Rosemary had left the camp, he went to leave, but Sarah pleaded with him to stay. Never would she be left alone in the woods. All she could do was hope that Rosemary returned. Soon enough, Sarah heard voices approaching. George rose, stealing himself in case there was trouble. It wasn't unheard of for bandits to be seen, preying on the vulnerable. Sarah was chewing her lip and wringing her hands, glancing in all directions for any sign of Rosemary. When she heard these voices, she leapt up, hoping that her friend had returned, perhaps with a scolding from Lord Flynn's guards, who she was sure would not take kindly to their duties being interrupted. Sarah wasn't sure why Rosemary had decided not to declare her true identity, but perhaps she had thought better of it and revealed that she was the intended bride to Lord Flynn. However, it soon became apparent that whoever these men were, Rosemary was not with them. Can I help you, gentlemen? George asked. He shook his head to Sarah, indicating for her to remain quiet. The guards chuckled to themselves as they came forward. As yet, they did not look threatening, although Sarah wondered what trouble Rosemary had gotten herself into. The tall man with the moustache was not with them, neither were the prisoners. Sarah cursed Rosemary, wishing that she had stayed focused on her own business. Not really, we were just wondering who you are. It's strange to see the likes of you travelling alone at night. It can get dangerous in these woods, we just wanted to make sure you were safe. Lord Flynn likes to know that his subjects are looked after. Oh, I'm sure, and it's very kind of you to ask. I don't suppose you happen to hear any noise? No, no, not us, George said. We were just settling down for the night, ready for a day of travelling tomorrow. The guards peered around at their camp. Where's the other one? one of the guards asked. Excuse me? George said. Sarah's heart was beating as quickly as a frightened bird's. The other girl. I'm sure there were two of them before, and there are two blankets around the fire there. What are you keeping from us? Nothing, 
I, nothing at all, George said. The guard suddenly turned vicious, pushing George up against the carriage. It rocked slightly. You'd better not be lying to me, the guard said. I don't like liars, and neither does Lord Flynn. There was a very secret thing happening in these woods, so I'm going to ask you again. Where is the other one? George glanced over at Sarah, who wished she knew what to do. She felt utterly powerless and looked towards the direction where Rosemary had disappeared, but there was no sign of her. She ran, George admitted. She got scared when you walked by earlier. I think seeing the prisoners gave her a fright and she was convinced they were going to escape and come after them. It's such a shame as well because she was Lady Brambley's handmaiden. Sarah gasped. Had she really just heard correctly? Lady Brambley, the guard said. You mean Lord Flynn's bride? I do indeed. That's Rosemary Brambley over there, George gasped. The guard stepped back, allowing George to breathe a little more easily. Sarah's mind lurched. Truth had always been a virtue close to her heart, and now she found herself caught in a lie. She desperately hoped that Rosemary would return to the camp, but with every moment that passed it seemed a forlorn hope. This is the Lady Brambley, the guard said. Apologies, my lady, I did not know. Of course we are sorry for disturbing your rest and extend every courtesy to you. Would you like us to stand guard or escort you to Lord Flynn's estate? Sarah didn't know what to do, so she shook her head. Do not take offence, sir, George said. The young lady is merely shaken by the ordeal. The absence of her handmaid took her quite by surprise, and as you know all young women get quite nervous before meeting their husbands. Our horses need rest, and we shall be making our way to Lord Flynn's estate tomorrow. Thank you for your kindness, and I hope your business has not been interrupted. The guard grunted at George, and then the three of them moved away. As they did so, Sarah heard one of them remark that they expected Lady Brambley to be prettier. Sarah's hands were shaking and she could barely breathe. George immediately came over to her and placed his hands on her shoulders. Sarah was still looking around for Rosemary to return, but it was becoming clear to her that Rosemary was gone, perhaps even dead. What did you say that for? Sarah gasped, her face as white as a sheet. To save your life, George said, glancing around to ensure the guards were out of earshot. You told them I was Rosemary, Sarah said, still in shock. I had to. They were going to kill us if we were ordinary people. How could you tell? Aside from the look in that man's eyes, it was clear from the way the other guards were acting. They had their hands on the swords, and given what we'd seen before, it was clear they didn't want anyone to know what was happening. I'm sorry for putting you in difficulty, but it was the only way I could think to save your life. Sarah's initial frustration with him dissipated, and she quickly thanked him for his actions. Nervously, she looked around. I don't think she's coming back, Sarah. As much as I don't want to believe it, I think Rosemary may have stumbled upon something she shouldn't have seen. We should at least look for her, though, Sarah said. George advised that they wait a little while for the guards to leave, and in that time Sarah had a chance to think about what they were going to do. Perhaps we should return to Lord Brambley's house, George suggested. And tell him that his daughter is dead, she asked. The question was left unresolved as the guards returned. Sarah's heart sank. She was convinced that the moment they caught her in the lie, they would kill her. Stay strong. Keep with the lie for as long as possible. Right now, it's the only thing alive. Hopefully, we'll be able to sort this matter out when we have reached Lord Flynn's estate. The guards returned to them. As soon as Sarah saw them move from the corners of her eyes, she embraced silence and sidled closer to George. There has been a change of plan. We are going to escort you to Lord Flynn now. We don't believe he would like the thought of his wife waiting in the dark. We shall fix new horses to your carriage, and we will bring you home with us. From the guard's tone it was clear that it was not a suggestion. George helped Sarah into the carriage, and both of them wondered what had caused the guards to change their minds. Sarah overheard one of them mention something about someone getting killed, and she hoped with everything she had that they were not talking about Rosemary. 
The horses soon got underway, and Sarah looked forlornly at the camp she was leaving behind, with it every chance she had to see Rosemary again. She may have escaped with her life, but she doubted she would be blessed with it for long, once Lord Flynn discovered the lie, and he would discover it. It was only a matter of time. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Chapter 9 Blair looked down at Rosemary, who was weeping heavily. Never before had he seen such a vulnerable display of emotion. Something inside him was sparked, something that told him he needed to protect her. It was typical of the English to kill their own, and he was sure that his foe would have killed Rosemary if Blair hadn't stopped him. It did not surprise him that an English lord would show such dishonour as to hang innocent men in the dark forest. It was a place for dark, secret deeds, and it was an English trait to be so dishonourable. What he hadn't counted on was this girl. She was as delicate as a flower, and yet there was an inner strength to her that he had not expected to find in an English girl. The way she had held that javelin, willing to stand up to him even though she was exhausted and weak, it made him admire her, and he found himself drawn to her. It didn't help that she was the most beautiful creature he had ever seen either. Her tawny brown hair fell down to the middle of her back, thick and cascading. Her wide eyes gleamed with life, and her slender figure was perfectly proportioned. She was delicate, dainty, and a total contrast to the women with whom he was normally surrounded. She spoke well and was evidently a woman of high breeding. The way her flesh had felt when their hands had touched had elicited a strange response from within. Her skin was so soft, so supple, he found that it was difficult to concentrate on anything else. Even now he was entranced by her beauty, his eyes lingering on the nape of her neck, imagining the wonders that were covered by cloth. Blair was a mighty warrior, but never had he encountered anything that could render him mute. He stared at her ruby lips, intoxicated as much as if he had drank a gallon of ale. For such a woman to cause a reaction like that within him was remarkable indeed, and only served to cause him confusion. She was English. How on earth could he feel that way about her? Still, as she was weeping, he wanted to aid her in any way he could, but he was unsure how to. He could not slash away her tears with his sword, or pierce her sorrow in the heart with his javelin. Instead, he sat beside her. As he did so, her body shifted towards his. Rosemary's head fell against his shoulder, and she shook terribly as crystal tears ran down her face. She was still more beautiful than anything else he had ever seen, though. In silence he sat beside her, wondering what had happened to her handmaiden. It didn't seem very loyal of her or the driver to leave without searching for Rosemary, but perhaps they had had no choice. Given what he knew of the English, it wouldn't have surprised him had there been something underhanded going on. They were always masters of subterfuge, wily as a fox, and just as dangerous. In time, Rosemary began to speak. It's over, it's all over. I have lost everything, she said. You're still alive, Blair said. And what good is that? You wouldn't understand what I'm going through. Someone like you would never understand. Someone like me? Maybe ye should try me. You may find that I am more perceptive than ye believe, he snapped, taking offence at the way she talked down of him. The English always had a misguided view of the Highlanders. Rosemary looked at him with her liquid eyes, red and sore from how much she had been crying. Would you really? Would you really understand how I feel about having left home to marry a man who would hang men who did nothing more than steal a loaf of bread? How my closest friend has been taken away, with me having no idea how to find her again? She may well have ended up dead like those other men, and it is all my fault. Would you understand that I cannot return home because my father would only push me back in the direction of Lord Flynn? I am stuck between these worlds, and to make matters worse, the man who saved my life is a Highlander, who may well take me away at any moment. I simply don't know what to do. I'm sorry if saving your life was such a burden for you, Blair replied, trying to be patient with her. 
but it was difficult when she was so intent on offending him at every opportunity. I said you wouldn't understand. How could someone like you understand? You have not had your life mapped out for you since birth. You have not been told who you are to marry without having any choice in the matter. You are not now lost in the wilderness with no prospects and no hope. I am Lady Brambley. My entire future was tied to be married to Lord Flynn. If I return home and declare to my father that I cannot marry him, he would ask why, and I would have to shame the Lord. He would not look kindly upon my father, and word would spread through society. I would not be able to achieve a favourable match, and my house would suffer. At least if I was dead, my father would not have to bear the shame of having a failure of a daughter. You're nay a failure, Blair found himself saying. I am. All I had to do was keep to myself, behave as a lady should, and meet my husband. Instead, I had to go and investigate. All my life I wanted an adventure, but it is not like the stories I was told. They were always glorious tales, but I was never told how difficult it would be. I should have kept quiet and been the good, quiet little lady like my father always wanted. I didn't believe that ye could ever be quiet, Blair said. Rosemary looked at him, shocked, but quickly realised that he was joking. She shook her head and laughed, possibly because there was nothing else to do. Perhaps not, she said, settling down again. The weeping had stopped which was a relief. She still seemed sombre. Blair picked up a couple of sticks and kindled a fire where the previous fire had been. Sparks flew and the flame burst into life, crackling lively. The warmth spread between them. Rosemary moved a little closer to the fire. You make that look so easy, she said. It is, once you can how. I've realised tonight just how much there is that I do not know. Rosemary said. There is always still much fur ye to learn, like how us Highlanders are nay the mindless barbarians ye believe us to be. I did not believe anything of the sort, she protested. Blair arched an eyebrow. Rosemary muttered something under his breath. Blair decided not to press the issue, but he knew that he was right. He smiled to himself, finding a great deal of joy when she showed signs of discomfort. You seem to have much to learn about us. I do recognise myself in much of which you say. You do? she said, surprised. My life is quite similar to which he described, he said, surprised at how much her own upbringing mirrored his own. My father is the leader of the clan, and I am his eldest son. Ever since I was a boy, my parents had groomed me to take over from him when I came of age. That still doesn't sound as bad as mine. At least you would get to lead your clan. No wit if I die, nay no want I lead. As I high ma to read, I high realise that there is my tie being a leader than running tie battle. In peace things are far different. My parents high had my life planned out for me, but I didn't wish to follow their path. I would like to forge my own path and be a master of my own destiny. But is it not your duty to do right by your family? Our family is not as important to Highlanders as they are to us. Blair glowered at her. Our clan is the most important thing to us. It does not sound the most important thing to you. Maybe nay, but that is only because I want a life for myself first. I want a chance to gain my own glory, to crush enemies. War is simple. All you need is to defeat the enemy. I ken how to do that, but I didn't ken how to lead. I thought I would feel a yearning to take over from my father, but knew the time is coming close and all I wish to do is run away. He sighed and stoked the fire. I had always believed that leadership of a clan should be earned. The people should look up to their leader and talk about his great deeds. The best I had done is slaughter mindless animals. It was nay like that firm of Fether. He fought in the war with the English. He sealed his destiny with fire and blood. No, everyone tells me that it's time for him to pass leadership to me. But why? because I had his blood inside me. I had done nothing to be worthy of this honour. It all feels so hollow. I suppose that is nay very heroic. No, it isn't, but it is understandable. Perhaps you and I are not as different as I first thought, Rosemary said as she rubbed her hands over the fire. 
She turned her head to look at Blair from over her shoulder, and she looked entirely coquettish. Blair found an ache beginning in the pit of his stomach, spreading out over his body. An intense heat focused on his groin. But what would you do with your life if you were freed from the responsibilities of your duty? Blair considered her words for a few moments, mostly so that he could regain his composure and breathe easily after feeling the intense attraction for her. It was forbidden, yet that made it all the sweeter. I would be free. I would run like the wild animals, living off the land, moving from place to place without any ties. I would spend my days hunting and my nights gazing up at the stars. I would hain a duty and a responsibility. And no one, Rosemary said, does that not concern you, of living a solitary life? You would not be part of a clan then. You would be a wolf without a pack. At times it does appeal to me. I would find that very lonely. All my life I have been surrounded by family. Even though I have entertained thoughts of running away, I have always been afraid of being out in the world alone. What if you get ill or tired? Who would be there to mop your brow and watch over you? Who would be there to love you? If you want that, then you should go and find your husband. I want a love that's true, not one that has been forced. I am sure that in time I could have learned to love Lord Flynn if I had not seen evidence of his true nature. I have known loneliness, however, and I would not want to experience it again. Ye hae kent loneliness, Blair said, shocked. My mother died when I was young. She doted on me and spent as much time with me as she could. My father tried to make up for her loss, but it was difficult for him to do the job of both parents. I felt a hollowness in my heart that has never gone away. She laughed softly to herself. I have never told anyone that, actually. I don't mean to cause offence, but you are the last person to whom I thought I would be revealing my secrets. Maybe fate is playing a trick on us, Blair said. Rosemary smiled again. She had become much more agreeable now that she was sitting down and had a better hold on her emotions. The night was getting late and her eyelids fell heavy. She yawned and stretched her back. It was an entirely pleasing sight. Once again, Blair felt those strange feelings of arousal flood through his body. We should try and get some sleep. You can decide wit today in the morning, he said. Rosemary protested, but her words were interrupted by deep yawns, and she sank to the ground, closing her eyes. She curled her body up tightly and was soon asleep, her chest rising and heaving. Blair reached over and brushed the hair away from her face. Framed in moonlight, she looked ethereal, and had he not been touching her at that precise moment, he could easily have imagined that she had been ripped from his deepest dreams. Chapter 10 The night passed swiftly, and Rosemary found herself woken by the trilling of birds. She yawned, stretched her arms, and enjoyed the feeling of a well-rested night. Upon opening her eyes, she was shocked to see Blair sprawled on the ground where Sarah had been. In her sleepy haze, Rosemary had almost dismissed the events of the night as a bad dream, but reality quickly took its hold upon her again. Rosemary had just about gotten over the shock of seeing so much death, although she was still terribly afraid for Sarah's sake. Blair, however, was a different matter entirely. At first she had been afraid of him, but the more time they spent together, the more she was getting used to his presence. He wasn't at all what she had imagined from the stories she had heard about the Highlanders. He was thoughtful, even sensitive to a degree. Looking down at him now, he looked so peaceful. Soft snores rumbled through his lips, and his powerful body was dominating the ground. Muscles upon muscles rested upon his warrior physique, and she had never seen anyone in such good shape. Rosemary pushed herself up and took the opportunity to look at him in the full light of day. His skin was tanned and freckled in places. A thick bed of hair coated his chest, which narrowed down his stomach. His hair just barely touched his shoulders, and stubble lined his jaw. He was manly in every sense of the word, and merely looking at him was enough to make her shiver. The feelings she enjoyed seemed so wrong, 
yet they brought her so much pleasure she was averse to dismissing them entirely. It wasn't at all proper for an English lady to experience such flushes of desire for a Highlander, but Rosemary found it difficult to be in control of her feelings. It was more than just a mere physical desire, though, the way Blair spoke to her and treated her. He had saved her life, and when she had been weeping he had simply sat there and waited for her to talk. He treated her in a way no other man had before with sensitivity. Opening up to him had been a product of exhaustion and vulnerability, but she was glad it happened as it made her see Blair in a new light. He had admitted that he felt some of the same struggles as she did, and it turned out that the two of them had some common ground. There was still plenty for her to think about, though, including what to do next. In the clear light of day, things seemed just as dismal as they had done the night before. One of Flynn's guard was dead, killed by Blair. The dutiful part of Rosemary told her that she should find some kind of authority and turn Blair in for murder. But how could she when Blair had only killed to save her life? He was the enemy, but she found that she sympathised more with him than she did with Lord Flynn. Blair began to stir. He rubbed his eyes and looked at her. Rosemary blushed. The way he looked at her sent a thrill through the middle of her body. His piercing blue eyes were always locked on her, transfixed, and she often thought that she would crumble under the sheer force of his gaze. I'm surprised you're still here. I would have thought you'd have taken the first opportunity to escape from a brute like me, he said with that all-too-confident grin. It was maddening the way he seemed so sure of himself, but Rosemary thought that may well have been a mask. After all, he had admitted to her that he wanted something else in his life, but he did not seem to know what that was, aside from a vague hope that he could run wild and free like an animal. Rosemary hadn't said it outright last night, but she couldn't have thought of anything worse. I don't think my chances of finding my way through this forest are much better than they were last night, she admitted, and I didn't want you to get into any trouble. Blair grinned. He sat up and patted his stomach. I'm famished. I didn't suppose you have any food. All my food was in the carriage, Rosemary said. As if on cue, her stomach rumbled and she blushed. Then the first order of business is Ty get breakfast. I shouldn't be Ty long, he said, and motioned to leave. Wait, Rosemary said. She hated to admit it, but she didn't want to be alone. Would you mind if I came with you? She expected a cutting remark, and perhaps Blair had one ready, but he held his tongue and agreed. They skulked through the morning light. Rosemary felt a lot better for having the sun shining down, rather than being cloaked in the gloomy dark. She did wish that she could bathe, however. The sprint through the woods had not left her looking her best. Then she wondered why she was concerned with looking her best in front of Blair. Have you thought about what you're going to day next? he asked quietly scanning the woods for prey. Rosemary followed his footsteps. Not yet. I wish there was some way to find Sarah, but I don't know how. Let us deal with breakfast first and then I shall think, she said, hoping to buy herself some time, but anxiety swam through the pit of her stomach. No option seemed like it was any good. Blair walked forward, but Rosemary froze when she realised they were close to the location of the hanged men. She tried to tell Blair to turn back, but he said that he wanted to see it for himself. Reluctantly, she followed him, as seeing that sight again was better than being left alone. They walked into the small clearing and saw the hanged men. Their skin had sagged and turned grey, and a horrible stench wafted through the air. As soon as they saw them, Blair stopped. I ken that man, he said, looking straight at the man of few words the one who had locked his gaze with Rosemary. He was also hanged, probably after Rosemary had run away. Blair walked up to him and shook his head, as if to make sure that it was who he thought. Who was he? The son of a chief in another clan. I didn't ken him well, but I knew him well enough. He was an equal tamey. His father will be grieving. I'm sorry, I don't know why this man died. Probably fur he is Scots that is often enough. Flynn may have had a good reason, Rosemary began in a faltering voice. 
Why do ye defend that man? Blair thundered. Rosemary was taken aback by the force of his words, and she did not have an answer to him. Is it just because he is English? Rosemary cast her eyes to the ground. Blair had gotten his answer. He shook his head and walked away. Rosemary followed, but did not say anything else. Now it was time for her to be silent. She felt guilty at having angered him so, and felt pity for the man who had been pierced with the sword and hanged. If she had not been a witness to the man's killing, she would have assumed that the Scot had done something wrong, something to justify his punishment. But instead she was left knowing that Flynn had meted out a cruel injustice. The truth was unpalatable to her, leaving a bitter taste in her mouth. Blair strode through the forest, skin reddening with frustration. As soon as he found a small animal, he leaped on it and thrust his javelin in its throat. The poor rabbit stood little chance against the barbarian, and Blair had soon killed it. This act did not seem to have tempered his mood any, and Rosemary found herself scared of what he would do next. They returned to camp. Blair skinned the animal. Rosemary looked away, disgusted by what she was seeing. Did you think your meat skinned itself? Blair replied in a surly manner. He roasted the rabbit over the fire, and despite the circumstances under which the rabbit had died, the smell and sight of the meat had Rosemary's stomach rumbling. When they were eating, Rosemary nibbled at the meat while Blair ripped out huge chunks with his teeth. His lips smacked as he chewed with his mouth open. A little decorum wouldn't go amiss, she said. You expect me to be calm when I had just seen one of my kin murdered? He thundered. Rosemary bowed her head. I can only apologise for the actions of Lord Flynn, she said. Blair continued to chew on his meat for the moment, but seemed to calm. Thank you for the apology, although I would need take anything less than hearing the words from this Lord Flynn's mouth as I choke the moot of him, he growled. The primal, savage side was coming out of him again. Rosemary found herself scared and intrigued in equal measure. Blair didn't seem the type of man to live by half measures. He felt everything completely and never held anything back. Rosemary continued to nibble on her meat, and the breakfast had a palpable tension to it. The Sassanaxi always been the same way, thinking they can march anywhere they like and do anything they want. They are ne'er had respect for us. Perhaps if the Highlanders did not invade our homes and take our women, sack our towns, things would be different. You're brave to taunt a Highlander like that. My father said I was always too outspoken. It is something I learned from my mother. I do not believe one should hold their tongue when important matters are being spoken. You speak with great distaste of the English and of Lord Flynn. Do you really feel that the best thing to do is to kill him? I have half a mind to storm into his home, Blair said. I will prove you true. I will invade his home and take anything I want. I may start with his wife. Blair stared at her coldly. Rosemary shifted her position slightly, smoothing down her skirt. And what? Begin another war. That is what would happen. And most likely you would be killed, probably before you even made it to Lord Harold. I hardly think his guards would let you walk through his estate without taking action. I would slay them all. Then what, you would run back to your clan and tell them that you have murdered an English lord? Granted, I do not know them but I cannot imagine your parents would be pleased with your actions. I know you thirst for war, but that does not mean you should bring it upon your brethren. It's nay right that a Highlander was slayed so easily, without any chance to speak his defence. No, it's not, Rosemary said, but I don't know what there is to do about it. The power resides with Lord Flynn. She was beginning to see that the world was made up of shades of grey rather than stark columns of black and white for Rosemary would never have believed she would feel pity for a Highlander. If it helps, he met his death with dignity. He did not flail or thrash like the other men, nor did he plead for his life. He seemed to be at peace. It was still an ignobly end. Fauclicus should fall in battle. It strikes me that you have a grim vision of your future, Rosemary said. She was beginning to get vexed about his attitude to life. His brooding was only attractive to a certain degree, but now she was frustrated with his constant attempts to cast a shadow over his existence. 
At least he had a family he could go back to. At least he still had his future in his own hands. In what way? You talk of battle, of dying, of leaving your clan and running through the wild. Where is the happiness in your life, Blair? What do you hope for, aside from spilling English blood over the land? I. Because if that is truly what you want, then you can begin with mine. Take your sword and bring its metal against my flesh. Perhaps my blood will satisfy your need, and then you may find that there is more to life. I would nay kill ye. Why, because I'm just a defenceless woman. Is my English blood not worth as much as Lord Flynn's? If you are truly hungry for battle, then you must begin with me. Embrace the fury, throw yourself into a rage and leave my body lying on the ground. You shall be doing me a favour, of that I can assure you, for there is no hope that I will amount to anything. By this point her voice had risen, and so had she, standing above him, jabbing a finger into the air. Her face was drawn in sharp lines, and she was trembling. Rosemary's words hung in the air. Blair rose. Her eyes lifted as he towered above her. She was so small compared to him, and an edge of fear rippled through her. Suddenly, she thought it was not the best idea to goad him into attacking her, for he could have snapped her in two like a twig. Rosemary had no idea what he was going to say next, and when she searched his eyes she found herself unable to understand what was going through his mind. This mystery enticed her, scared her, but most of all she felt a wave of arousal wash over her. Before she knew it his hands were on her, pulling her into him, then his lips pressed against hers. Her moan was stifled, and at first she was rigid, trying to break free of his embrace, but the force of his kiss quelled her resistance. A warm feeling spread through her body, his lips were like fire, and while she was being held so close to him she could feel his powerful heart thumping. Her hand rested against his chest, and she scraped her nails through his hair. For a moment the world disappeared. The kiss scorched her soul and Rosemary had a feeling she would never be the same again. When the kiss was over, Rosemary fell back onto her heels, for she had been lifted off the ground. Dazed, she smoothed her skirt and her hair, trying to compose herself and remind herself that she was an English lady, and that behaviour was unbecoming of her. Yet when she glanced at Blair through her heavy-lidded eyes, she found herself wishing that the kiss had not ended. What did you do that for? she asked. It seemed like the right thing today. Oh, so you did not wish to do it of your own accord? Now nah, it's nay that I... I found Mazelle unable to resist. Nobody has ever spoken to me the way ye day. Perhaps that is why you have turned into such a lout, she teased. Blair pressed his lips together and grinned. Rosemary took a deep breath. The morning tension had dissipated, although it was replaced by something entirely more powerful, intoxicating and terrifying. Never before had Rosemary experienced the feelings she held inside her, and she wondered what the proper behaviour was. She was alone in the woods with a Highlander, breaking all the laws she had been taught. She should walk away, should leave this adventure and return to her own life. She should hold her tongue and do as her father wished. Provide Lord Flynn with a family and turn her eyes away from the injustices of the world. But she found that she could not. Rosemary wasn't quite sure what she wanted in that moment, but she knew that she did not want to be unhappy, and that was the only fate awaiting her if she went to Lord Flynn's estate. The fire was dying, and the morning sun bathed the world in golden warmth. Birds sung, and trees rustled with life. We should decide what we are going to do now, she said, although I strongly urge you to reconsider your plan to storm into the estate. I shall nay. Blair said reluctantly. It would nay be prudent. But I must return to my clan and tell them of wit I ha learned. Maybe it's best that ye return to your father. He may be mere reasonable than ye expect. Allow ye to find another lord to marry. Rosemary was shocked by his words, but even more shocked at her reaction. Her heart lurched, as though she had just been struck a blow. Did their kiss mean nothing to him? Had she done something wrong? As a lady, she had never kissed anyone in that manner before. 
With what she knew of the Highlanders, they had far fewer manners, and it was a possibility that Blair had enjoyed the embrace of women before. Rosemary felt a flash of jealousy, and more than a bit of embarrassment that she had done something wrong. You wish me to leave? Wit is the alternative? I could come with you, she said. The words were out of her mouth before she even thought about what they meant. Even so, she did not want them to retreat into her mouth. I know my father, Blair. If I return, he will encourage me to go to Lord Flynn, and I shall be forced to marry that man. I do not want that fate for myself, but at the moment I see few alternatives for me. I... I am willing to admit that I do not know enough to live out in these woods alone. Any of my father's allies would never offer me shelter, as they would be too afraid of suffering Lord Flynn's wrath. I am not like you. The wild does not call to me. I cannot be alone. Blair considered her words for a few moments, and then he nodded. Chapter 11 The two of them were soon on the move. Blair found it difficult to imagine that she could be hardy enough to endure the trek through the woods back to his clan, and he wasn't entirely sure what the reception would be at home. However, he found himself pleased that she had decided on this course of action. Now that he had a taste of her, he wanted more. The way Rosemary had spoken to him had lit a fire in his soul that had only been stoked by the passionate kiss. The taste of her lips had been sweet, and never would he have imagined that an English lady, so delicate, could have had such fire in her heart. She faced him without fear, and that was something he greatly admired. The thought of an English lord having her as his wife filled Blair with disgust and a deep resentment. Despite what she said, Rosemary had the spirit of the wild in her, which surprised him as he never thought he would find such a thing in an English woman. That quality would go unappreciated by an English lord, and Blair saw it almost as his duty to rescue her from that life. More than that, though, he wanted to be near her as much as possible. He was intoxicated by her scent and often found his gaze drifting towards her. Never before had a woman had so much power over him, and the kiss they shared showed him how childish and chaste his first kiss with Deirdre had been. In the back of his mind, however, dark thoughts were stirring. The death of Gaul weighed heavily on his mind. It was not right that Lord Flynn captured and killed the man, and Blair would see to it that justice was done. Taking his wife was the first step, as for the second. Blair would have to speak with his father about that. It was a matter that could not be ignored, however, and the other clans would surely see sense too. Perhaps it was time for the English and the Scottish to resume hostilities after all. Peace was never going to last for an eternity. The two of them walked through the forest. Blair was a few steps ahead of Rosemary, and he kept his eyes out for any sign of danger. I imagine soon these woods will be teeming with guards searching for ye. Blair said. Indeed. Lord Flynn does not strike me as the type to relinquish hold of anything too easily. Blair chuckled. Always you use these big words. It amuses me that you make speech more complicated than it has to be. Rosemary lifted her nose. There is nothing wrong with using the benefits of an education, she said. I am sure if you received the same schooling you would use these words too. Such ways are useless. Ma education was in the wild, honing skills that allow me to survive. I suppose that is needed in your environment. Tell me, where exactly do you live? I hope there is at least some kind of shelter. One night of sleeping in the open is enough for me. Blair narrowed his eyes at her. For all her loveliness, Rosemary could still be quite harsh with her words. For such an educated lady, she did not seem all that wise about simple matters and Blair thought she was very fortunate to have encountered him. One night in the wilderness alone would have been the death of her. I live in a castle. It may be a humble building compared to some of your estates, but it serves us well. The rest of the clan live in huts and tents. We feast the gither, we hunt the gither, we sing the gither, and we compete the gither. It sounds like a nice family, Rosemary said. Blair looked at her with sympathy. 
Still having difficulty with the reality that his father was going to die soon, Blair felt a connection with Rosemary as she had lost her mother. Did ye ever truly deal with the loss of your mither? he asked. Rosemary looked a little shocked. Did I say something wrong? he asked when Rosemary did not answer immediately. No, it's just that I do not usually speak of such things. After she died, my father, well, he never liked talking about her. I think it was too painful for him to be reminded of our lives before she died. How did she die? By an illness. It struck her down one day. More than one doctor came, but they could not prescribe a cure, only things to make her more comfortable. Even to the end, she was resolved to enjoy her life as much as possible. I don't know ken how I will feel when Ma Faither dies, Blair confessed. If you are anything like me, then you will feel empty at first, like a piece of your heart has been torn out, and there is no hope of ever getting it back. Then you will move forward in life, but you will be changed. Nothing will be the same again. I believe that the death of a parent is when you lose the final part of your childhood innocence. You are fortunate that it has taken this long to happen. Mibby, although I find it difficult to imagine a world we oot my father, I ha ne'er kent a world we oot him. I am sure that whatever you are feeling, he is feeling it ten times as much. When my mother was on her deathbed, she was still concerned with my well-being always trying to make sure that I would be the best person I could be. I hope I am not failing her. I didn't believe so. You're making a difficult choice, but it's the one that will keep you safe and offers you the best chance of happiness. We're nay brutes, and ye shall nay be in danger from us as long as ye didn't pose a threat. We will offer ye sanctuary, he promised. Rosemary smiled, and to see her face light up as such brought him great delight. I fear we could be causing trouble. If anyone should find out that I have come with you, they will not believe I did so willingly. In truth, I am finding it hard to believe, Mazelle. Rosemary grinned again. You have some rough edges, but you are not as barbaric as I had assumed. I am sure there is a lot more we can learn about each other, Ty, he said. An arrow split a tree trunk beside his head. He moved a split second after the loud thunk and chips of wood fell against him. He had been so entranced by Rosemary that he had lost awareness of the dangers surrounding them. Rosemary yelped as she fell to the floor. Another arrow flew through the air and lodged in another tree. Anger flashed before Blair's eyes and he pulled out his javelin. Searching the trees, it didn't take long for his expert eyes to find movement. In a flash, he reached back and then flung his javelin forward. It hurtled through the air and found its target unerringly. A cry of pain could be heard, and then the satisfying sound of a body slumping to the floor. Voices cried out, and by the sounds of it there were four or five other people. They were English, but as they emerged from the woods, Blair could not tell who they fought for. Blair stood before Rosemary, drawing his sword. Stay down, he warned her. The English sauntered out one by one, circling him. Blair switched between targets, watching them like a hawk to see which of them would strike first. First blood to the Highlander, I see. Well, that's the last blood you'll draw today, one of them said, a slender man with a thin moustache above his upper lip. He drew a rapier and jabbed it towards Blair, who deflected the blow easily. But the attack was just a distraction from the other men, who moved towards Rosemary. Fear not, fair maiden. We shall rescue you from the clutches of this monster. This only served to increase Blair's rage, however, and he thrust his sword into the man's throat. Warm, dark blood flowed out. The quickness of the man's sword did not match that of his tongue. Blair turned and roared at the other three men who had their hands on Rosemary. She was clawing at the eyes and kicking out at them. None of them understood why she was acting so defensively. Blair kicked one of them off and then brought his sword down upon another, splitting their spine. Rosemary rolled out of the way, but as she did so, one of them reached out a hand and pulled away her locket. It snapped off, and before Blair could do anything else, they fled. It had been a swift attack, and the cowards had easily been dissuaded from their course of action by Blair's ferocity. He ran after them for a few steps, 
cursing at them in his thick Scottish brogue. But Rosemary pulled him back. The colour had drained from her face and she needed his help to stand. Where did they come from? she asked. They must have been tracking us for a short time. I apologise. I should have been aware of them. No, it's not your fault. I'm just frustrated they took my locket. I could hunt them down and retrieve it. No, please don't. It is better that we resume our journey. The sooner we get out of these woods, the better I feel. Blair agreed with her, and the two of them continued, this time in silence. The attack had clearly shaken Rosemary. Blair was only left with questions, though. What were the English doing this close to the border? Had any other Highlanders died at their hands? It almost seemed to him like there was something greater occurring, the reality of which stayed firmly beyond his grasp. His immediate concern was Rosemary. Although she was spirited, her life had been sheltered, and she had not been exposed to the same realities of the world as Blair had been. To her credit, she was not weeping. Rather, she had her jaw set and was marching forward along with Blair. He wondered if she had the same questions as he did. After walking for much of the day, they reached Blair's home. Rosemary's speed slowed as they approached. You shall nay be harmed, he said softly, but he understood why she was reticent to move forward. Upon his return, all eyes were upon him and the woman he had brought back. Blair pulled back his shoulders and moved forward, ignoring the looks. Rosemary walked quickly to keep up with him. He made his way straight to the castle, not giving Deirdre any chance to come up and speak to him. He found his parents and Drew sitting in the throne room. His father looked even weaker than the previous night. Had he only been gone one night? It seemed as though so much had happened in such a short span of time. Upon seeing them enter, his mother, Fianna, and Drew stiffened. Aif remained seated. Wit is this Blair? Drew asked. There is much I must speak to ye aboot, he began, directing his words at his father. So it would seem, Aif said, looking at Rosemary. Where would ye like to begin? Blair glanced at Rosemary but decided not to speak about her for the moment. Gaul is dead. There was a sharp intake of breath from Fianna. How did ye discover this? Ify said. Whit are ye done, Blair? Drew said in a wary tone. Blair glared at him. I had done nothing. Gaul was hanged by an Sassanac lord, Harold Flynn. I didn't ken why, but it seems as though it was fur the crime of which we're all guilty, being Scots. I ken Gaul liked to go out ranging. I imagine he was captured and then hanged in the woods like a thief. There was no trial, no attempt to defend himself. I must send word to Ciaran, Eif said quietly, his shoulders slumping. And your other matter? Is that all you say? A Highlander was murdered. Is there to be no retaliation? We can he simply hide in these hills and valleys and let the Sassanacs get away with this. Wit would ye hae me day, Gal is name a son, I hae no right to declare war. So ye admit ye would declare war if I had been captured and hanged? Mibby, if ye did nothing to deserve it, Eif said. Blair was enraged, but then saw the smile tugging at Eif's mouth and the teasing gleam in his eyes. He lifted a wrinkled hand and pointed to Blair. You're always tay quick tay act tay rash. This matter is Kieran's right tay deal we, and he shall hear of it. I am mere concerned we why ye were so close to the border and why ye honey introduced this girl. I am Lady Rosemary Brambley, Rosemary said, stepping forward, lifting her nose up, offended at being referred to as a mere girl. Concern was etched on all their faces as they heard her accent. Blair, Drew said. It's nay wit, you think. Rosemary was being pursued by one of Flynn's men. He was ready to kill her when he came into Marpath. I slew him. And you brought her back here? Drew said, aghast. Masson, wit high ye done? Ify said, putting his heed in his hands. He saved me. Your son is a hero, Rosemary said, stepping up to stand beside Blair. Ma son is a fool, Ife sighed. Blair bristled. How can you say such a thing? I thought you would be proud of me, Fayther. 
I have proven myself in battle against a Sassanac knight and bandits rather than mindless beasts. I had nae done anything ye would nae had done in your youth. Ye you ran away from your duty. Ye have brought home a Sassanac lady, provoking what could be a dreadful retaliation. Sometimes I think you're so eager for war that ye will day anything ye can ta see it happen. I did this because it was the right thing today. The ape of legend would see that. Maybe I have been blind all this time. I believed that you were still a warrior underneath that heavy cloak. You're nothing but an old man knew. Whatever light once shone in your mind has dimmed. I was hoping that this could galvanize ye into running with us again, in defending this land from the Sassanax. Why are you so afraid of your path? How dare ye, I've said sharply. Ye dare call me a coward? Look long and hard at yourself, Blair, because soon I will need be here to point out your faults. Before Blair could reply, Fianna stepped up from her throne, pressing her hand to Ife. The poor dear looks as though she has been through a lot. I will see that she is bathed, she said, escorting Rosemary out. Rosemary had little choice. As soon as the women had left, Blair stepped forward to be closer to his father and his brother. I did nay take her against her will, Faither. She was in danger and I rescued her, then she was alone. She could nay return home as she did nay want to be married to Lord Flynn after she discovered he was a monster. She did nay want to be left alone in the woods. I offered her sanctuary until she decides wit today. The last thing I wanted today was bring war here, or to dishonour ye. All my life I had tried to do everything I can to make ye proud of me. I had tried to do your legend justice. That has always been your biggest mistake. Aif shook his head. Ye proclaim to be concerned with your own life, but always ye look to the past. Ye see the life I lived and are swept away in the fine glory of it. Ye look to other paths and ye only see the best ways. Ye imagine that any life will be better compared to the one ye lead. Ye ne'er look to the reality of the situation. Ye de ne ken the realities of war. If ye did, ye would nay be so eager to be in the midst of it yourself. Every day I am haunted by the things I witnessed, the things I had tay day. Are ye saying you're ashamed of all the things ye did? Blair asked, shocked. Na Blair, I did what I considered right. But over the years, I had observed that ye wish to fight for glory and your honour. You want to fight because you think that it's how you will gain immortality. You're wrong, Blair. Do ye ken why I fought in the war? Because it was just. Because the Sassanax were invading our home and ye had to defend us. For duty and honour and all the things ye claim are such a sin. In part I fought for all of those, I've admitted, looking older by the second. Some I should nay have fought for. But the main reason I went to war was because of family and Ma clan. I wanted to defend them. Those are the most important things, Blair. You should be fighting for the folk around you. That is what gives you the strength to succeed. That is what provides you with glory. A warrior standing alone his little chance of surviving a war, and when it ends he will find that he fought for nothing. I fight for the clan Faither. You put the clan in danger by bringing that girl back here. Do you really believe Lord Flynn will believe that she came of her own accord when he discovers what has happened? Are you really so thirsty for a war that you would do something so reckless? Faither. Nah, I did need this to begin a war. I rescued her because she was in distress. It was the right thing today. It was a foolish thing. You should have sent her on her way. You had no duty to her, no ties. All you had done is bring the wrath of the Sassanax upon us. And what is so wrong with that? Are you saying that we canny defend ourselves? I am nay saying that at all, but we did nay need a war, Blair. The years he passed and we have been at peace. Ye should escort her back to the border and let the Sassanax deal with her. I shall nay. She does nay deserve to be treated as though she has no mind of her own. She is a Sassanac woman, an Sassanac problem, Drew said. Blair bristled again, tensing his muscles. I will nay see her harmed and forcing her into a marriage she does nay want is harming her. She should be free to choose her destiny. We all should, he said pointedly. Your choice could condemn us all, I've said. Drew folded his arms and shook his head. 
I think we all ken why you brought her back, he muttered. Blair arched an eyebrow at him. Are our women and good enough for ye? Did you really have to bring Sassanac blood here? You turn your back on our way of life at every opportunity, Blair. When we need you to be a leader, you run off on your own adventures without any thought of what is happening here at home. Drew, Afe said, trying to calm his son, but Drew would not listen. Nefather, it is time Blair hears this. I had tried to talk to you calmly. I had tried to make you listen, but at every turn you flaunt your independence. You spit on this clan, Blair. You clearly hain a respect for wit we stand for, and if you're truly so reluctant to take this throne, then you should simply disappear into the night and ne'er come back. Part of me had hoped you had done that last night. In some ways I think it would be easier. Blair snarled and stepped forward, placing his hand on his sword. Ma sons, Aif thundered, speaking louder than either son had heard him in years. Ye day me no honour by acting like bairns. I remember when ye were babies acting like this. It's neighbour fitting of ye. I am done with this. Blair, ye need to understand which ye truly want from life. I want ye to follow in my footsteps. Maybe it's my own fault for waiting until my later years to her bairns, but ye must understand that which ye had done here is incredibly short-sighted. To bring an Sassanac woman to our home is only inviting chaos. It was the right thing. Can we trust her? Drew asked. Yes, Blair said tersely. She has proven herself to me, and she is nay at all as I expected. Afe beckoned Blair to come closer, and with the same motion he turned Drew away. I can hear in your voice the way you feel about her, Afe said. Blair began to protest, but Afe told him not to argue. The way you stood by her, the way you looked at her and she looked at ye, I can tell that you feel the same things towards her as I felt towards your mither. It's nay the path I would have chosen for ye, my son, and you will it to tread carefully. Each decision you make has ramifications, some of which ye canny anticipate. You must look at what you're doing and decide if it's worth the trouble it may bring. Blair nodded. I could nay leave her in the woods, Fayther. I ken why ye could nay leave her. There are some fights a man canny win. One of those is when he fights against his own heart. I fear for the future of this clan if the Sassanax day attack. They will show no mercy, and if this Lord Flynn feels that his wife has been taken from him, he will nay take that slight lightly. Are you prepared to face all of the consequences? I am, Fayther, Blair said. Then you must look at the wider picture. None of us can hay the life we wish for ourselves. All of us, ye and I, mayor than most, her duties and responsibilities that weigh heavily upon us. I understand your frustrations. I experienced the same thing when I was your age. You did, Blair asked, raising his eyebrows in surprise. I've chuckled. Did you truly think that my life only began when I became Laird? When I had ye? I had dreams when I was younger. I wanted to achieve many things, but over time my ambitions changed. I realised that there were other things to worry about than Ma desires. First there came your mither. She opened Ma eyes to the fact that I could nay always day wit I wanted. I took care of her, and had to make Ma own ambitions secondary to our joint ones. Then came the tribe. It's nay a matter of giving up on the things you want, but readjusting your view of the world. Believe me, I wish I had mere time to prepare ye for wit lies ahead, but Ma time grows ever shorter. I need to ken that the clan is in good hands. Blair, if you wish to turn away from everything you ken, then you're well within your rights, but there is no return. You canny leave and expect to come back one day, and I believe that when you're out there alone in the wilderness, you shall find that it's nay as desirable as you once thought. Blair looked at his father with solemnity. It was difficult to face the reality that his father was an old man, life slipping away from him with every breath. Blair wished that he could say the right thing, but nothing seemed adequate. The speech from his father had the air of a man leaving wise words for his son, perhaps because he knew it was going to be one of the last things he ever said. Blair knew that he had not always been the perfect son, but he wanted Afe to know that the clan was in good hands. Life seemed so easy when he was out in the wild with nothing but the wind on his back. There were other forces to consider, though. 
and he had to think about others as well as himself. Chapter 12 Rosemary was ushered out of the throne room by Fianna. The woman looked much younger than Aeth, about the age of Rosemary's own mother if she had survived. Fianna was a stout woman with flaming red hair and a comely face. She seemed to be the type of woman to take matters into her own hands and not put up with any bluster. Do you not think I should be in there to speak of matters? Rosemary said. It's best to let the men talk. I am sure that ye would prefer to bathe, Fianna said. Rosemary could not argue with that. Her clothes were clinging to her body, and after all the running and walking through the woods, her hair was matted together in thick knots. It was also good to be away from Blair for a time. The tension between her and him was playing havoc with her mind. She was unable to think straight, and now that she was among the Highlanders, she wondered if it had indeed been the right decision to make. Mostly, it had been influenced by Blair. She hadn't wanted to end their adventure together when it had only just begun. To her surprise, she was led out of the castle. Are we not going to bathe? Rosemary asked. Of course we are in the stream, Fianna said. Rosemary paused for a moment, having never bathed in a stream before. The day was temperate and the hills around her were vibrant green. The air was fresh and sweet, and people were in good spirits. Rosemary was more than a little self-conscious, for many eyes turned towards her. Dinny mind them, they're merely curious. I suppose I cannot blame them. I imagine that they do not see English women often. They most certainly deny. It gave me quite a shock when I heard your voice. I want to assure you that I do not mean any harm to your clan. Unfortunately, that may nay be under your control. This Lord Flynn could strike at us at any time. I do nay blame ye as much as I blame my son. Blair has always been so hot-headed and he rarely thinks before he acts. This much I know, Rosemary said, sharing a sly smile with Fianna. They reached the stream. Rosemary saw that there were a few girls already bathing, stripped completely naked. Rosemary looked at them in awe of their bodies. They were hardy women, with sculpted muscles, and she felt entirely inadequate. Her body was slender and thin, with no muscle definition at all. These women had lived their lives outdoors, doing as much as any man did, while Rosemary had been sheltered in walls. It was a reminder of just how ill-prepared she had been to live a life of adventure. To her shock, the stream was not too far from the camp, and she was afraid that men would come by and watch. Ye day nay hate to be worried about that, Fianna said when Rosemary expressed her concern. The men ken that they will be batted around the head if they come anywhere near us while we're bathing. Rosemary was reassured, but still glanced into the distance as she stripped away her clothes and left them by the river bank. She held her arms across her body, trying to maintain her modesty in front of these strangers. Stepping into the stream, she felt the warm crystal water slip around her naked flesh, embracing her, and for a moment she closed her eyes and imagined it was Blair's arms. I hope Blair has been treating you well, Fianna said, standing above her. Rosemary cupped water in her hands and let it fall all over her body. It ran down her curves and her hair grew heavy. He saved my life on more than one occasion, and he has shown me nothing but kindness. That doesn't he sound like my son, Fianna said with a smile. Perhaps there have been moments where we have argued, but he has helped me through my ordeal. You have raised a fine son, I... I must admit that I was afraid of him when I first saw him, but he has done nothing to harm me. As it should be, Blair is a good man, a little misguided at times, but his heart is usually in the right place. He broods to much fur his own good. I noticed that. He mentioned that his father is... I, Blair does nay like to face the reality of the situation. Aif is an old man, and old men die. We had hoped that Blair would be mere accepting of his destiny than he is, but he seems to want to walk his own path. I know something of how he feels. I was pushed towards a certain destiny, and I have run away from it. I can see why Yin Blair found common ground. I had always wanted the best life for my son, but sadly we're still feeling the ramifications of the war. In what way? 
Blair was brought up on stories of his father being a legendary warrior. He always enjoyed the thought of being like his father when he grew up, but there has been a war for him to fight. It's sad to say, but I feel as though he has found a war within himself. He did seem to fight with relish, as though he had been waiting for it all his life. Maybe it's partly Ma failing as a mither. I tried to open his mind with other stories, but always he gravitated to war. He and his brother played the gither as youngsters. His brother was always the Englishman, of course. Blair was the strongest, the fastest. In some ways he was bred fur war, nate rule in peacetime. I feel sorry for him sometimes. I wish he could find peace in this life. Ife and I were glad when the war was over. He and the other clans fought to ensure safety for their children. But Blair has ne'er come to terms with the gift we gave him. I can try to make him understand. So you plan to stay here for a while? If I am able. There is not much of a life left for me. I would like to return to my father, but that means I would be sent to Lord Flynn again. I do not want to have anything to do with that man. Are you prepared for the consequences of your actions if you stay? It will ne be an easy thing to live here as an Englishwoman, especially ne if war breaks out. There are many who will blame ye and Blair. I believe so, Rosemary said. Fianna clasped her hands together and nodded. Ye are nay what I expected when I heard your voice. I can see why Blair brought ye home. I shall get you some fresh clothes. I will return soon. Fianna left before Rosemary could ask her what she meant. As far as she was concerned, it had been her decision to accompany Blair, rather than a case of him simply bringing her with him. Rosemary sank down into the water, letting it wash the entirety of her body. It was refreshing to be under the water, to feel its cooling touch upon her skin. While she was submerged, however, she thought of Blair's kiss and the fire it stoked within her. She was almost embarrassed by the intensity of her feelings. It was difficult to know what was going through Blair's mind. The kiss told her plenty, but what followed from that had been nothing so far. Now she was in his home, among his people, and she did not know what he had planned for her. Although Fianna was nice, she didn't get the sense that the rest of the family approved of his decision to bring her back. The surface of the water broke as she emerged. She looked around at the vast expanse of hills and knew that she was in the lands she had always dreamed of, the lands she had gazed at out of her window. She was living her life, an adventure, and she had no idea where it would take her, but she was glad she had taken this course. Blair had caused an earthquake in her soul, shaking her beliefs about everything. For such a barbarian he was gentle and protective, and she knew that she would never have enjoyed the same intensity of feelings for Lord Flynn. The only sorrow was that her father must be worried. One day she would have to return to him and tell him the truth. While she hated to disappoint him, she knew she couldn't do anything other than be with Blair. So your wit Blair dragged back a shrill voice said. Rosemary looked up and saw a flame-haired woman staring down at her, arms crossed over her chest, eyes narrowed. It seems so, and who might you be? Rosemary asked. Ma name is Deirdre. I hope you enjoy your time here, short as it may be. I have no plans to leave soon. Ye should. A man like Blair would have cause to spend any mere time with a girl like ye than he had to. Ye must have been truly helpless for him to take pity on ye and bring ye back. He rarely shows that side of himself. You don't know anything about what you speak, Rosemary said. She didn't know anything about this woman other than that she disliked her immensely. I ken mare than ye. I hae kent Blair since Bairnskip, and I ken what is good for him. A weak Sassenach woman like you would ne'er be able to keep up with him. Get yourself clean and then leave us. There isn't a place for you here. I choose my own place, Rosemary retorted. Then Dini be surprised if you're flung from your place. Life in the Highlands can be very rough. Delicate Sassanac flowers like yourself soon find themselves plucked. Rosemary was aghast at the hostility shown by Deirdre. She frowned and began to move forward, but her foot slipped against the surface and she fell backwards, water splashing all around her. With crimson cheeks she stood again, wanting to wipe the smug smile off Deirdre's face. Rosemary was about to give Deirdre a sharp lashing with her tongue 
when Fianna returned. Blair's mother took one look at the two women, then told Deirdre to leave. She helped Rosemary out of the stream, and Rosemary placed the clothes over her. They were rough and scratched her skin, but she tried not to look ungrateful. One day she was sure she would be back in luxury, and in that moment she would enjoy the comforts of soft clothes more than she ever had before. Who was that? Rosemary asked. That is a Bairnskip friend of Blair's, one who is nay content with being anything other than his wife. Oh, I did not realise Blair had such an agreement with anyone. He does nay, Fianna said, smiling at Rosemary in such a way as to tell Rosemary that Fianna knew exactly what was happening between her and Blair. Blair High's always gone his own way, in everything he does. I shall keep that in mind, Rosemary said. I am sorry for the havoc I caused. I did not mean there to be so much disruption. Such is life, Fianna said. Enjoy your time here. Learn what it's to be a Highlander. You may find that you're surprised with the way we live. Rosemary had certainly been humbled so far. She had previously believed that the Highlanders were nothing but barbarians, barely able to speak two words to each other. But now she was faced with a thriving community of people, all strong and brave. Feeling refreshed after her wash, she went back to the castle to find Blair brooding by himself. Fianna pointed her to Blair's room. Rosemary smiled as she remembered what Fianna had said of Blair, how he often brooded more than he needed to. Rosemary knocked lightly. Blair lifted his head and welcomed her in. The room was a square, with bricks all the way around. There was a thin rug draped across the floor and a chest against one wall. Seeing it reminded Rosemary of all the possessions she had lost. A window looked out on the rolling hills of the highlands, a world that seemed to stretch out for an eternity. There was a stool in the corner, which Rosemary picked up and brought to the bedside. How did the talk with your father go? she asked. Blair ran his hand along his jaw and smiled, although it was a smile devoid of any real humour. Nay, as well as I would have hoped, he told me some truths, which I suppose I would do well to accept. Such as, that my life is nay my own, that na life is. I ha always thought that if I just tried and fought for what I wanted, I could achieve everything. But I knew realise there are more things to consider. No matter how much I may wish it to be so, I am nigh in this world alone. I ha a clan to think of, and I dare na ken which way to turn. I know it is difficult. Your mother said much the same to me, and spoke of the consequences of our actions. I hope you didn't encounter any trouble while you were outside. No, aside from Deirdre. Apparently she didn't take kindly to you bringing me back. Deirdre would nay, Blair scowled. Has your opinion of us changed? By some degree. I did not realise you lived like this. All the stories I heard painted you as barbarians, pillaging everything that you could find. But I see now that you are just people, like the rest of us. Blair leaned back, stretching his mighty body and chuckled. I am glad your eyes have been opened. It is still hard for me sometimes after all that I have learned. It makes me wonder why the war began in the first place. Why does any war begin? There are always a number of reasons. Yet it seems that those who are the most affected are the ones who did not join the war in the first place. My handmaiden Sarah. Her parents were killed by Highlanders. Many orphans were left this side of the border as well. Rosemary's breath caught in her throat. Although it was a clear truth, she had not thought about that side of things. I suppose I never considered that there was a war on both sides. After last night I should imagine that the nobility of the Sassanax is in question. I suppose that it is. I am ashamed of my people. Dark deeds were done on every side. War is nay always a place for glory, as much as I would wish it to be so. Rosemary stood up and went to the window. I wonder what happened to her, if she is all right. I imagine so. The carriage must have been taken back to your faither. Or Lord Flynn. I worry that my actions have threatened her safety. She is out of your hands new, Blair said. 
It didn't bring any comfort to Rosemary. She was tired of feeling so out of control. People were getting hurt, and she could do nothing about it. If a war broke out again, who else would get hurt? I have been thinking about what my father said. The choice to bring you back here with me. I believe it was I who insisted on returning with you, she interjected. No matter whose decision it was. It may have grave consequences, ones I didn't think about on the trek back. I was so blinded by thoughts of Gaul, and then the attack by those Sassanac bandits that I didn't think about anything else. What are you saying? I am saying that by keeping ye here, I am endangering the entire Highlands. Do ye think Lord Flynn will refuse to act when he discovers that you're missing? How would he know you were to blame? I'm sure he blames Highlanders fur a lot. Even if he does nay ken fur, sure he would likely use it as a reason to foray across the border and make raids upon our lands. All the clans would be in danger of the war. Unless I return. That is nay wit, I said. It is what you intimated. Blair, you cannot expect me to return. You know that nothing good waits for me there. But the safety of all the highlands. I thought you wanted war. I hae been made to see things differently, he said. Rosemary spun to face him, glaring at him. He was sitting forward with hunched shoulders, looking haggard and weary. So you are willing to throw me back to the English? Back to where I belong? Nah, I... You would see me married to Lord Flynn? Cursed to live a life with that monster? I... In the woods you spoke so often of what you wanted. You have shown me many sides to you. None of them fearful. Yet now I look at you and I see a man who is afraid, afraid to make a choice. I am nay afraid, Blair said, slamming his hand down on the bed. He rose too and marched towards Rosemary. Fear filled her, the kind of fear that was tinged with excitement. Whit would ye hear me day? I rescued ye, but in doing so I could bring the wrath of the Sassanax down upon our heads. Gaul has already been lost and who kens how many other Highlanders have been hanged in the woods. Am I to believe that if the time came ye would stay here with us? Your home is over the border, your blood is Sassanac, and there is nothing I can do to change that. My blood may be English, but my heart is my own, Rosemary said with a cold fury. You and I have spoken much about choice. I chose to come with you. I choose to be here now. If there is a war, then I would make another choice. The question is, what choice would you make? If you could end this war before it began by sending me back to live a life I did not want, would you do it? What choice are you going to make, Blair? The time for you to run is over. It was too late when you found me, when you agreed to let me come with you. If you want to send me back to the English, then put me out of my misery now and do so, or kill me. Throw me out of this window and leave my body in the woods for the English to find. To her surprise, Blair moved as though he was going to do exactly that. He grabbed hold of her arms, but instead of pushing her away, he pulled her closer to him. For a moment they locked eyes and then, seized with an uncontrollable passion, Blair kissed her once again. His lips fell against hers, sizzling and ardent. Her body collapsed into his embrace. She felt soft and smelled sweet. His powerful arms wrapped around her, enveloping her in his warmth. When she argued with him, it caused arousal to sweep through his body, and he was filled with an uncontrollable need to be close to her, to be intimate. His hands squeezed her body, roamed around her rough clothes. One sank into the small of her back, pressing her tightly, the other rose up and wove through her hair. Moans burst against his lips, and he felt himself succumb to an unyielding passion, one that would not be sated until he had all of her. Burying himself in the nape of her neck, he moaned her name and began to tear at her clothes. Pressing her against the wall, he felt his primal passion surge through him and was ready to listen to his desire, to make the only choice that seemed natural to him. Are you sure you want this? Rosemary whispered. I am English after all. Aye, ye are, but I canny resist ye. Ever since I saw ye, I have been wanting to be close with ye. The mare I ken ye. The mare I forget your Sassanac. It's as though you're the same as me, but different. His lips hovered close to hers, so close she could feel the warmth of her breath. Nye, 
Are ye happy by being this close to your barbarian? A smile played upon Rosemary's lips. Happy is not the right word. There is another feeling inside, one that I cannot properly express. Their lips pressed together ever so briefly. They were interrupted by a knock on the door. Leave us, Blair bellowed, spittle flying from his mouth as he turned to glare at the person who dared to interrupt them. He softened when he saw that it was Drew, who stood there stony-faced. You must come, Blair. It's Fayther, he said, and turned, walking down the steps. Blair paused for a moment, his heart sinking for he knew what must have happened, yet he did not want to face it. He turned to Rosemary, his face ashen. The moment of passion had dissipated, left barren and hollow. Nausea ran through his stomach as he raced down the steps following Drew. He caught up to his brother, who was walking in staggered steps, his legs looking as though they could fall out from under him at any moment. They walked into the throne room and Blair was shocked to see his father laying on the floor. He collapsed. It came out of nowhere. He clutched his heart and then fell off the throne. There wasn't a chance for anyone to day anything, Drew said, his voice devoid of all emotion. Fianna was there and ran up to her children, embracing them wildly. Blair's eyes stung with sorrow, but he was not weeping yet. Extricating himself from his mother's grasp, he walked towards his father and sank to his knees, taking Aif's withered hand in his own. Father, Blair choked, feeling awful that he had not been able to tell his father how much he loved him and how grateful he was for Aif giving him life. It was also shocking to see how a mighty chieftain could die in an instant without a glorious send-off to the heavens. Sometimes the gods played cruel tricks on men. There was so much left unsaid, Blair whispered. Fianna came up to him and placed her hand upon his shoulder. He knew, Blair, he knew, she said, before dabbing her eyes again. He only ever wanted you to be his son. Day right by him and think of all he has taught ye. Be the kind of man that he knew ye could be, nay the one from the stories, nay the one that will be spoken of in a song, but the man that will be loved by his clan and his family. Word spread throughout the camp and soon everyone rushed in. Blair was surrounded by people who all offered their condolences. The hall was filled with weeping, wailing and sobs. Drew removed himself to stand by the side, looking like a ghost. Fianna and Blair were left to receive the people. Blair looked past them at Rosemary, who was separated from him by a sea of people. There were so many thoughts rolling through his mind. He had to make his father proud, and yet all his life he had been fighting against everything his father had believed in. Blair had tried to ignore this moment for as long as he possibly could, but now Aif was dead, and it was his duty to take the throne. The wooden chair had always looked so big to Blair, and now it was his duty to claim leadership. He found himself walking to it, as though he was in a trance. He reached it and placed his hand on the side. Are you ready to embrace your destiny? Drew asked. Blair's brother stood beside him. It seems as though I day nay hay a choice. Nah, and I hope the clan will be better for your leadership, but you need to think about what you're choosing today. You're talking about Rosemary. We every moment here she proves a threat to our clan Blair. I canny believe you would be so foolish as to bring an Sassanac girl back here, but you must rectify this mistake or you will doom us all. I shall day nothing of the sort, Drew. Just because I wanted to be free of these shackles does nay mean that I have nay been prepared for this life. I shall be a good leader for this clan, and I will nay let the Sassanacs or anyone else harm us. Brave words, but you may find they're harder to live by than you think. We shall see, Blair said. It was a shame that their father's death seemed to push the brothers further away rather than bring them to each other, but each had to deal with his grief in his own way. Blair stared at the throne and thought about all it entailed. His life was now tied to this throne. Perhaps it had always been. He had a responsibility to his people now, but he also had a duty to his own heart. It was not such an easy thing to dismiss Rosemary, even if it would mean safety for his clan. He could not allow her to go back to England, not with what awaited her.
not with the feelings in his heart. The thought of her being taken away from him made a ferocity bloom within his soul, and his feelings for her were just as intense as the sorrow for his father. Never would he have imagined that he would feel that way about an English woman, but he could not deny them. Ma son, Fianna said, standing beside him, it's time new for ye to take your rightful place. I ken this is nay what ye always wanted, but it's your duty. Your father and I are proud of ye. He loved ye, and he wanted ye to ken that before he died. He also wanted ye to ken that he felt just as reluctant as ye to take the throne. It's nay so easy a thing to embrace one's destiny. It takes great courage. Sometimes it's braver to turn from one's dreams, to sacrifice them for a greater good, than to push everything else aside for them. I am nay sure I will be able to do that mither, but I shall try my best, he said. Then with a heavy heart, he turned to face his people, addressing them for the first time as their chieftain. Ma Fauk, he began, today we mourn a great man. When I was young, I was brought up on stories of his deeds in battle. Ferte long hay I been tay focused on those stories that I had been blinded of who our father was as a man. I had always thought that the true honour in life was being tested on the battlefield, of forging a soul in fire and blood. I had striven to attain such glory for myself, and to be remembered as a great warrior just like my father. These highlands had been free of war for a number of years new, and I knew realise that is the gift my father gave us. He rode into danger to fight for us. That is the mark of a true leader. Knew that my father is dead. I find that I day and remember him as I thought I would. I day nay remember the stories I have been told about him. I remember how he taught me and drew how to ride a horse, how to hold a weapon. I remember him sitting me on the knee as he listened to your problems and offered advice. I remember him telling me of the great honour of being the leader of the clan. Blair felt tears well up in his eyes. He took a deep breath and looked at the uncertain faces staring back at him. They all doubted him because of how absent he had been, but he was not going to fail them. He was not going to fail his father. I ken I will ne'er be as good a leader as Mephatha was, but I will try and be the best I can be. I will ne'er dishonour you. Everything I day I believe to be right, and I believe to be wit my faither would have wanted. I will ne run away again. I will ne go off and hunt animals as often as I used to. I will offer advice. I will protect ye. Today we mourn my faither, but tomorrow we will celebrate his life. He achieved many things for us, things that shall ne'er be forgotten. We will use his example to give us strength. I will need all of your help to help to be the best leader I can be. I am nay perfect, but none of us is. This is our future, though. This is our lives. I am proud to be the leader of this clan. I am proud to be Blair, son of Ife. It was a sombre occasion, but he was met with cheers. A young man was sitting on the throne again, a man who they all hoped would have a long and prosperous reign. Chapter 13 The day had been long. Rosemary had barely seen Blair. He had been separated from her by a wall of Highlanders, and she didn't feel she had the right to interfere. Everyone was filled with sorrow, which was a testament to just how beloved Ife had been. There were also murmurs of discontent about Blair, many of which were whispered around her as they concerned her presence. Rosemary wished that she could be with him and help him mourn. She knew what it was like to lose a parent and the toll it could take on the surviving children. She was also scared for her own future. After that kiss, she hoped that Blair would not turn her away and force her back to Lord Flynn, but Blair had changed now. No longer was he the son of the chieftain. He was the chieftain and had to act accordingly. Rosemary couldn't imagine that their relationship, such as it was, would be looked upon favourably. She also had to ask herself if it was what she truly wanted as well. If she bedded Blair and stayed with him, there would be no chance for her to return home. She would have exiled herself, and although her prospects looked bleak in England, was it a possibility she wanted to close off completely? Do you see how much you dinny fit in? Deirdre asked, the fiery woman sidling up to Rosemary. Rosemary stiffened. This is my clan. 
These are Mar Falk. You should scurry off back to England and get back to your own. Blair has finally accepted his place as leader of this clan, and soon he will recognise that it's only right he should be married to me. There isn't a place for you here. Leave Nu while he is distracted. Make your way into the forest and walk south. This isn't a place for a Sassanac flower. With that, Deirdre left, but Rosemary was not going to follow her wishes. Although she had her doubts about Blair, Deirdre's insistence made her want to stay. She kept to herself. Most of the Highlanders were polite, although wary of her. She couldn't blame them, for she felt the same way. Food was passed out, although the feast was not a spirited affair. The mood in the camp was gloomy, as one would expect when their leader had died, and Rosemary wondered what would happen if her father passed away. She gazed through the darkness of the evening towards the border, towards her home. She had sacrificed so much to get here. Was this what she really wanted from life? That thought was met with one of Blair, and instantly she knew it was. Blair filled her with desire and happiness. Being in his arms was the place where she felt at home, and even though he was a Highlander, she did not want to break apart from him. However, she may not have a choice. All her life the main choices had been made by men, and this was in his hands too. If Blair wanted to push her away back to the English, then she would not be able to resist, and she would have to live an unhappy life. Was that a price she was willing to pay to avert a war? Was it a price Blair was willing to pay? Anxiety resided in her heart the longer she was apart from Blair. Who knew what effect this would have on him? It was only late at night after the meal was finished that Blair came to her and took her away to his room. It was cold at night, and Rosemary shivered. I'm so sorry, Blair, she said, wrapping her arms around him. Blair pushed her away, which broke her heart. He walked over to the window and looked out, much as she had done earlier. I used to think life was so simple, he said. It's a curse that we must grow up. But it is one we cannot avoid she replied. I wish I knew the right thing to say or do, she said. So badly she wanted to embrace him and soothe his pain, but the sting of his rejection was still hurting. Had so much changed in such a short amount of time? Had she been deluding herself for thinking that the two of them could ever have a life together when they were from different worlds? As day I'm our head is clouded with many different thoughts, share them with me. I, I canny. Blair, she said, falling to her knees before him. We have been through so much in such a short amount of time. There is a connection between us. I cannot pretend that I understand it, for we are so different, but it is there all the same. I feel it here, she pressed her hand to her heart, and I know that you do too. But I shouldn't, because I'm English. Mayor than that. Your Lady Brambley, your betrothed to a Sassanac lord, one who has made a secret of his willingness to kill Highlanders. Your very presence here threatens my folk, my family. I wonder what my father would day, he said softly. Hearing the words slip through his lips made her realise how much she truly wanted him, how much she wanted to stay here. Yet she knew it could never be. Resigned, she tilted her head down from Blair so that he could not see the tears glistening in her eyes. Blair, you cannot think that any longer. You are the one leading this clan now, and I can see that I do not have a place here. Perhaps in another life we could have shared something more. But if I stay, I am only going to cause you more pain. I should return home. England is clearly where I belong even if I will only be greeted by an unhappy future. I wish I could stay longer to ease your pain, but it is better that I break the bond between us now before it becomes any harder to leave. Goodbye, Blair. I hope that one day you find your place in this world and find peace. Holding back tears, she rose, but before she could turn and make her way to the door, Blair shot out a hand and grabbed her arm, holding her so tightly that he left red marks upon her pale skin. Nah, he growled. Blair, she gasped. He tilted his head to look at her. His eyes swam with tears. 
When she looked in them, she saw the gravity of his emotion, and her heart went out to him. It beat for him. I canny allow you to leave, he said. Again that fear came. He was a wild man, a highlander, and she was a fool if she ever thought that she was entirely safe with him. You must. I canny. If you walk out of that door, I ken I will never see ye again, and that is a fate I am certain I dare nay want. I have made mistakes in my life. I will nay let this be one of them. I have been struggling with my feelings fur ye ever since we met, ye Sassanach. I should nay hear this desire fur ye, and yet it burns inside me, a raging fire that will consume me if I dare nay hear ye. Ye will stay, Rosemary. Even if it means Lord Flynn will attack you and declare war. I always wanted to live in a war, but I ne'er knew what I would fight fur. The greatest honour would be fighting fur love, he said. Rosemary's breath caught in her throat at the mention of the world love. It was such a simple world, yet meant so much. Blair stood, taking her hands in his. He looked down at her, and she looked up at him. Rosemary, I dunno ken wit the future holds, but I ken that I will be able to bear anything that comes our way as long as we're the gither, he said. Rosemary's eyes were still filled with tears, but when they trickled out it was with happiness. This time when she flung her arms around Blair he did not push her away. On the contrary, he held her tight, his hands roaming around her back, smoothing her, and they loving embrace soon turned to something more. You pushed me away moments ago, she whispered, their lips barely apart. A mistake I shall ne'er make again. I want ye. I need ye. All of ye. I ha' kent this in my heart ever since we first met, but all my life I ha' been taught the Sassanacs are the enemy. I ha' ne'er been able to forgive them for the crimes against my people, but no, he said, his last word barely finished before he pressed his lips against hers. Rosemary melted again and fell into his embrace. She let go of all her preconceptions about Highlanders, all her fears for the future, and she made a choice. Her choice was to be with Blair. The feelings inside her were so intense, so passionate, that she didn't think she could live without them. She pushed forward, and the two of them fell onto the bed, laughing with each other as they showered kisses upon each other. Their hands entwined, gripping on tightly until their knuckles turned white. Pleasure swam through her body as his kisses moved from her lips to her neck, his hot breath washing over her skin. He drowned in her hair, and his hands groped at her clothes, as did hers. They tore their garments off of each other, exposing their skin, throwing the clothes to the floor. Rosemary looked at Blair's impressive body. She let her hand linger against his chest, running her fingers through his thick, dark chest hair. The skin beneath was tight and taut, honed by years of living in the wild, running free with the animals. A primal, savage energy emanated from him, intoxicating Rosemary, playing havoc with her mind. Dazed, she felt desire rush through her and surrendered to it willingly. Her hands reached further down, as did her eyes, and when they fell upon his thick, hard manhood, she felt a thrill surge through the middle of her body, and her loins began to burn. Her eyes lifted to meet Blair's, and in them she saw a reflection of herself. He looked at her with great ardour, as though she was the most beautiful thing in the world, and this only served to increase her arousal. Running her hands around his broad shoulders, she twined her fingers in his hair and pulled his head into her once again, kissing him more passionately this time, their tongues dancing inside. Blair's hands ran down the middle of his body. Spread out, his palm could almost encompass her entire chest. The heat from his body was sizzling, and beads of sweat soon began to trickle down her skin. He rolled his fingers along her breasts, teasing the hard nipple, twisting and pinching it, which made her convulse. Smiling widely, the pleasure rippled over her like the warm sun, and her neck arched as his hand reached further down until it was stroking her inner thigh, until she was completely at his mercy. Blair, she moaned as her eyes clamped shut and her mouth opened widely. Hot, frantic breaths burst out as his hands delved between her burning thighs. 
A bliss unlike she had ever known shot through her like a spear and soothed the aching that had grown. Sinking into the bed, she let the feeling of his fingers delight her. Rosemary's body writhed underneath him, drowning in the searing heat of his body. His fingers were deep inside her, curling back, eliciting pleasure forth. Blair grunted as he kissed her, and then slowly moved down her body, still with his fingers inside her. His tongue teased her nipples, sucking on her breasts, before he left a trail of kisses all the way down her stomach. Then his head fell between her legs, and his rampant tongue joined his fingers. Rosemary's eyes shot open at the intensity of the sensation she felt. Blair's hair brushed against her thighs as his tongue twisted, creating a whirlwind of pleasure inside her. His strong arms coiled around her body, possessing her, and she loved every moment of it. At first her arms splayed around her, but as the arousal increased they fell down and gripped Blair's hair, forcing him to go as deep as possible until a silent scream rumbled through her throat and escaped. A warm wave rippled over her body, making her naked flesh break out in goosebumps. Her skin was flushed, and she was left gasping and weak, moaning incoherently, head falling to one side. Blair slithered up her body and caught her lips. She could feel the hot wetness lingering on his lips, and it made her heart quicken. You taste so good, he whispered, and she murmured with delight as she pressed her body against his, taking in everything. Her hand fell naturally down by his stomach and then went deeper, finding his strong erection. Veins rippled along the tight flesh and the mushroom tip was smooth. Rosemary curled her fingers around it and smiled as she saw Blair wince in delight. She had the mighty warrior at her mercy, but all she wanted was to bring him pleasure. Slowly, Rosemary brought her hand up and down, feeling the rock-hard flesh between her fingers. It was so heated so strong, just like him, and she was filled with the desire to do to him what he had done to her. She rolled him onto his back and slid down his body, breathing in his masculine scent, losing herself in the muskiness of his sex. Now that she was beside it, chapter 14. Sarah was in awe when she reached Lord Flynn's estate. The grounds were huge, and the manor itself dwarfed Lord Brambley's house. Anxiety swam through her stomach. The ride to Lord Flynn's estate had taken up the remaining night, and although she had the opportunity to sleep, it had not come to her. The morning sun brought no relief either. For the entire duration of the journey she would look out to the woods and wish she had the courage to leap out, for she thought that a silent death there would be preferable to the humiliation that she would surely suffer due to the lie she had been forced to tell. George proclaimed that he had saved her life, but as far as she saw it, he had only caused her more distress. Moreover, her best friend in the entire world was surely dead. The carriage arrived at the mansion. Sarah was shown out. The building was huge, and a mass of people moved around, more than she had ever seen. Life at the Brambleys was positively tranquil compared to this. Sarah glanced around nervously, wishing there was some way for her to flee, but she was trapped. The only way for her to move was forward and embrace the lie. Finally my bride has arrived, Lord Flynn shouted. He was a wiry man with a thin moustache and shorted than she had imagined. He wore a bright gold tunic and marched quickly, not one to waste any time. As he moved closer he beamed, but the smile quickly fell from his face as he saw Sarah. She knew she was not as beautiful as Rosemary. Welcome to your new home, he said, his words faltering. It was clear that he was disappointed with her, as he had a right to be. She was not born from nobility. She was an orphan, a mere handmaid, but she had to play the part. Curtsying, she tilted her head and smiled sweetly at him. It is an honour to be here, she said. I hear you had some trouble on the journey. I apologise for any distress, he said, glancing to one of the guards. I arrived here safely, that is all that matters, Sarah said. Indeed, I was also told that your handmaid ran away. It is a shame that one should be surrounded by such cowards, but that is to be expected from a mere handmaid. 
It pleases me that you have shown courage and bravery. You shall make a fine wife, Lord Flynn said, and welcomed Sarah into his home. She was told there was to be a ball later in order to celebrate her arrival, but first she was told to rest and get used to her new surroundings. Sarah wondered where the tall man with the bushy moustache was, as he wasn't with any of the guards. She also gazed to the woods, hoping that somehow Rosemary had made it alive. The maids fussed around Sarah and welcomed her to her new home. She was told that she would make a good bride for Lord Flynn, but also that she would have to have more of a spark to her. They went to take away her clothes to bathe her, but Sarah quickly dismissed them, for they would see that she did not have the infamous birthmark residing on her body. In time, the truth was sure to come out, but Rosemary did not know when or how. It felt as though she was in a prison, unable to escape, and eventually the noose would tighten and she would be caught. Part of her wondered if she should simply tell the truth to Lord Flynn. He was an English noble after all, he would surely respond with grace and equanimity, but Sarah was filled with fear. Perhaps when Lord Brambley arrived he would be able to speak of her virtue, and he would listen to the truth. Even then she doubted that he would show her favour, for he would have to face the loss of his daughter. Still, Sarah did not want to be selfish. For all the anxiety caused by her own situation, she was still safer than Rosemary. If Lady Brambley was not dead, then she was likely in the hands of some Scottish brute, and Sarah shuddered when she thought of that fate. Nothing would ever be worse than that. As the day continued, Sarah tried to quell the nerves inside her. She bathed by herself and made sure that her stomach was hidden from view. In preparation for the ball, a number of gowns had been presented to her. They were all lavish and far too grand for her to wear, but she had to pretend to be Rosemary and chose a deep green dress. The longer the day wore on, the more comfortable she became, and for a time she even considered the possibility that she would be able to live this life and take Rosemary's place. It would require some finesse, but after having lost her parents, Sarah felt as though she was due some fortune. Then it was time for the celebration, and all the anxiety came back with force. Her hands shook as she approached Lord Flynn, who looked dashing in his tunic. He greeted her with a kiss on the cheek, and now that he saw her presented in such a manner, he seemed to be more pleased with her appearance. The celebration was only a small one. The grand ceremony would be held later, after the wedding, and that was when the moment of truth would arrive, for Lord Brambley would be there. Sarah told herself that she simply had to get through this ordeal one day at a time, and the longer she endured, the more likely it was that she would find a way out. During the ball, she was mostly left alone. Lord Flynn seemed to prefer spending time with his friends, using his bluster of conversation to talk down about the Scottish. He seemed to think that a war was brewing. We have noticed some of their warriors coming down to the border. It is surely only a matter of time before they attack. But when they do, I shall be ready with my sword and my bows. We shall drive them back to the highlands and rid ourselves of the threat once and for all. The colour drained from Sarah's face, for she did not want to be embroiled in another war. Vague memories of her childhood were coloured with shades of fire and blood. To hear Lord Flynn speak about war as something glorious and honourable was disquieting, for she knew it was anything but. If it hadn't been for war her parents would still be alive. Unlike Rosemary, Sarah held her tongue. Towards the end of the celebration, Lord Flynn took Sarah's hand in a dance. They swept across the ballroom as the violinist played, and for a moment Sarah knew what it was to be a noble lady. Lord Flynn whispered in her ear, promising a life of excitement and adventure, and an exploration of new virtues. He was so charming, and she was filled with excitement albeit tinged with guilt. She was lying to him even by saying nothing, and she was also claiming the husband of her best friend as her own. It was not right, yet Sarah didn't know how to extricate herself from the situation. As it happened, she did not have a choice in the matter. In the middle of the dance the door burst open. A group of guards marched in, along with a few bandits. One of them had a pencil-thin moustache, and was holding something golden in his hand. 
As he grew closer, Sarah saw what it was, and her heart froze. Why do you interrupt my celebrations? Lord Flynn thundered, glaring at the men. My apologies, Lord, but these men have something they think might be of interest to you, the guard said, and nodded to the bandit. He handed over the locket to Lord Flynn, who twisted it around. Opening it, his brow creased. He turned to Sarah. You never mentioned this was missing, he said. I... I suppose in all the confusion I forgot, she stammered. Where did you find this? Lord Flynn asked. In the woods, sir. We were walking through when we heard some commotion. There was a dark-haired English lady being kidnapped by a Scottish barbarian. We tried to rescue her, but she had lost her mind and fought us off. We managed to claim this before we had to make our retreat. Those men are bred fierce, more like wild animals than men in truth. Could this have been your handmaiden? Did she steal this from you? Flynn asked. Sarah almost lead, but before she could answer the bandit piped up. I've never seen no handmaid that looked like that, sir. Beautiful she was, almost caused us to have a heart attack. I've never seen anything like her, he said. Sarah took a step away, and Lord Flynn twitched. Under the strength of his gaze, Sarah wilted and turned her face away, hoping that he wouldn't see the crimson flush of her cheeks. Rosemary, what is the meaning of this? Lord Flynn said, turning towards her. The longer she took to answer, the more his expression changed and suspicion fell upon her. Before she knew it, the guards had surrounded her and were pinning her down. She was helpless to move, and fear seized her. What are you doing? she cried. Searching for the truth, Lord Flynn said. There has been something strange about you since you have arrived. I put it down to nerves, but now I am thinking there is something more. You did not act delighted when these men returned this locket, a prized possession for which I would think you would be grateful and joyful. Instead you seem scared and I wonder why that is. Tell me the truth. For a moment Sarah feared her life was in danger. Sweat beaded on her temples. All around her she saw nothing but angry faces. How foolish she had been to think that she could have gotten away with such a ploy. Wanting to stammer out an apology, she was unable because she was close to hyperventilating. There didn't seem to be enough air left in the world for her to breathe. Twisting her head, she struggled and begged to be free. The truth was that the locket wasn't hers. This life, this identity wasn't hers. Looking around her, she felt the walls closing in. Everything inside her began to crumble. It was so easy to surrender to him. But what then? What of herself? What of Rosemary? The only way she could live, the only way Rosemary could stay away from this cruel lord was if Sarah lied. It was a sin to lie to a noble, but to save her only friend in this world, she knew she had to do it. I... I am merely shocked to see these men again. They confronted us and demanded that we pay them ransom. I hoped the locket would be payment enough, but it seems they want to slander my name too. Lord Flynn, we have never seen this woman before, the leader of the brigands said. Sarah's heart beat as frantically as a baby bird's. You would dare call my betrothed a liar, Lord Flynn thundered. Sarah couldn't believe her eyes. With a wave of his hand, Lord Flynn ordered his men away. Sarah felt the grip loosen on her wrists, although the pain still stung. She looked with confusion at Lord Flynn. I see the truth in your eyes. These brigands need to be punished for daring to suggest that the Lady Brambley could be so mistreated. Guards, take them away, Lord Flynn commanded. The bandits looked shocked. They pleaded their case, but their words fell on deaf ears. Sarah tried to collect herself. Her chest heaved and her skin was flushed. She dabbed at her forehead with a handkerchief. Lord Flynn came up to her. I do apologise for having to put you through that, but I had to make sure. I know now from looking into your eyes that you are the true Lady Brambley. I shall do my best to ensure that we have a happy life together. Thank you, Lord Flynn. I shall do my best as well. If you do not mind... I wish to brighten my appearance, she said, wanting an excuse to flee the room. 
Lord Flynn agreed, and Sarah made her way out of the hall to a place of safety. When she was alone, Sarah leaned against the door and breathed heavily. Sinking to her knees, she placed her head in her hands and sobbed. A stroke of fortune had saved her. Lord Flynn had seen something in her eyes, although she was not sure what that had been. Perhaps it was because she had spent so much of her life in the presence of Lady Brambley that she knew how to act and look like a lady. Perhaps it was just that Lord Flynn saw what he wanted to see. It would have been humiliating for him to have welcomed a simple handmaiden to his lands. Trembling, Sarah collected herself. She held her up high and breathed deeply and smoothly. So far her secret was safe, and she would have to do everything to ensure that it stayed that way. Somewhere out there she was sure that Rosemary was still alive. It was Sarah's duty to protect her and live out this secret. She would have to be Rosemary. Looking out of the window at the wide expanse of lands before her, Sarah prayed for guidance. She would need all her courage, strength and guile if she was to maintain this illusion. But she was happy, for things could have gone far more violently wrong. Lord Flynn could easily have ordered his men to rip away her clothes and examine her body. One sight of her birthmark-free flesh and the ruse would have been discovered. It was a blessing that bandits rather than knights had come with the story. There had been many blessings so far, and Sarah hoped they continued. After she had composed herself, she returned to Lord Flynn and played the part of a charmed English lady, telling herself that she was through the worst of it. Lord Flynn gazed at her with adoration. Her seeming plainness did not deter Lord Flynn from pronouncing her a worthy wife, although she surmised this was because of her title rather than anything else. As long as he believed that, though, she was safe and sound and would definitely rather be in Lord Flynn's company than risk being taken away by the dreaded Highland barbarians. Chapter 15 A couple of days had passed since Aif's death, and since the night Blair and Rosemary had explored their love. Her presence in the camp had not gone unnoticed, and many had shown their discontent, but Blair had made a vow to her, and he was going to keep that vow until his death. His mother and Drew had fallen into mourning, but Blair did not have that luxury. There were too many things that needed to be done. Too many things that needed to be taken care of. The people were all going to look to him for guidance, and he had to be ready. It was difficult, though. Sadness resided in his heart. For so long he had looked towards his father sitting on the throne, wondering what went through the man's mind. Even after just a few moments of sitting on the chair, Blair felt he knew Aeth more than he ever did when his father had been alive. It was still difficult to face the truth that his father was dead. There were points when Blair felt as though he was going to wake from a nightmare and meet his father again. Sometimes he wished this was so, so he could make up for all his mistakes in life. He wanted to be closer to his father. However, changing anything now could risk his romance with Rosemary, and he didn't want anything to jeopardise that. Nothing could change the feelings he had within his heart for Rosemary. He felt more secure in himself than he ever had done before. Rosemary grounded him and gave him a tether to the world. His life now was far different than being able to run away into the forest to hunt, but that had only been the illusion of freedom. He had still been shackled to his misery and fears. Being bound to his clan was, paradoxically, freeing. He had a sense of purpose, a better sense of who he was and how he fit into this world. As the leader, he had to show the clan that he was willing and able to take Aif's place. For all his desire to be free, he knew that the clan needed him. With Rosemary constantly by his side, he took his place on the wooden throne and gazed out at the world just as his father used to, hoping that he could be as much revered as his father had been. Blair had a long life ahead of him, and there was plenty of time to achieve glory, even if it was not how he had always planned. The throne suits you, Rosemary said. A smile twitched at the corner of Blair's mouth. Commotion soon rose as an envoy approached. Blair and Rosemary stepped outside to find that Kiaran was alighting from his horse, flanked by powerful warriors, their faces painted in shades of blue. 
Kiaran walked up to Blair and they clasped hands, bumping their chests against each other. Your father was a good man. I was sorry to hear of his passing, Kieran said. Kieran was about ten years older than Blair, for Aif and Fianna had waited until late in life to have Blair and Drew. Kieran was as tall as Blair, but his body was more scarred, having fought in the previous war. Your words are met with gratitude, Blair said. I am surprised you had come so quickly. That is nay why we're here. We received a message from A for Boot Marboy. Blair's face fell. I also hate to offer my condolences. It was nay an honourable death. Nah, but ye can be sure we will find honour for him. Ye speak of war, Blair asked. Kieran glanced towards Rosemary. Is it safe to talk in front of her? he asked. I do have a name, Rosemary replied. Blair loved how she remained undaunted in the face of a man such as Kieran. She may have been English, but she had the heart of a Highlander. I'm sure you day, but it's your blood that worries me. Rosemary came with me because she was shocked by the cruelty shown towards your son. Weuta, I would ne'er have discovered Gaul's death. Then it appears I would owe ye a debt, Kieran said, bowing slightly to Rosemary. She seemed surprised, but pressed her lips together in a thin smile and inclined her head. There will be many who will disagree with your decision, Kieran warned. I am aware, but it was my decision to make, and I stand by it, as all men should. So you speak of war. It was the last thing my father wanted. Your father was a wise man. He won much glory in the last war, and his wish for peace was noble, but it's a wish that can be fulfilled. There was a reason Gaal was riding so close to the border. Many parties had been taken by the Sassanaks, and they had been encroaching towards our territory. They have been amassing forces. We think they're ready to strike. All they need is a reason to attack. At this he glanced towards Rosemary again. Blair knew that he had given the English the only reason they needed. If the Sassanaks attack, they will find that they will be met with swords and spears. We will nay yield to them, Blair said. You sound just like your father. He would be proud, Kieran said. Blair thanked him for the compliment, but he wasn't sure that Aif would be proud. Even since the war, Aif had tried to keep peace, and to know that Blair had plunged them into war would have him rolling in his grave. Blair offered him hospitality, and then moved away to be alone with Rosemary. It looks as though we canny escape this fate, he said. At least we shall face it together. Tell me, are you not pleased that you are here with me, rather than alone in the wild? Of course I am, Blair said, turning to her, cupping her face in his hands. He kissed her deeply, letting the love he felt for her fill him up. She was the most precious thing to him, and if he had to kill for her then he would. But now that he loved someone, now that he led the clan, he found that he was not so eager to have the war that he had always yearned for. Gazing to the horizon with the woman he loved beside him, he wondered what the future would bring. The English were out there, waiting to strike, and strike they would. There would be much death, but it was a price that Blair was willing to pay for his love. He led Rosemary back to their bedchamber where they could be alone, and there he lost himself in her arms. Click the first link in the comments or scan the QR code and read the story of Drew and Sarah in Highlander's Saviour. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.